I always recommend, I mean, I talk about it on this podcast, like, I like the fact that I studied poetry through mm-hmm. my undergrad and graduate school and not fiction, because I think it does prepare you more. It does, like, because, I mean, f- poetry is the higher art, you know, I'll just say it, right? Like, that's what it is. Sure. When compared mm-hmm. to fiction. So if you, like, study that and you get good at that, like, it's like, you're already getting good at fiction too, like, because you understand the language at a better level, a deeper level. That's my take on it, at least. That makes sense. For, for <clears throat> studying poetry. I don't know. I mean, I might just say fuck it and just like apply for both and just like see what they take. I don't know. Yeah, we'll I guess <laughs> sometimes it comes down to what they have room for with the slots. But if you're doing like remote low res, like you should be good uh, for okay. either one. I mean, it depends, but yeah. Gotcha. Well, thank you. I'll probably like through the process, like pick your ear about it and stuff. If you don't like, totally mind. Yeah, just send it in the chat, or you could email me or something. Yeah. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy. 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 Bored. meeting of the heavy board book club commence <laughs> the first official meeting and this is something we just started here on heavy board all you listeners out there and this is this is going to be released as like a regular episode so all of you out there listening if you want to join me and Shaylin and uh, others in this heavy board book club where we do i think i'm going to do it bi-monthly uh i feel like that should be a good pace to start uh, sign up, sign up at heavy bo- patreon.com slash heavy board, uh, and the double ply tier and above, you get instant access to this, whether you want to participate or not. And we're going to be, we have a group chat set up where you can just chime in, ask, uh, suggestions, things you'd want to cover on the book club. And, uh, we just arrange it on the group chat there on Patreon and then we show up. So this is the official first meeting of it. So welcome everyone to the a first official meeting of the Heavy Board Book Club, and uh, we have Shaylin here coming on in. How you doing, Shaylin? Pretty good, pretty good. How's it going? Happy Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's a good Friday, good Friday. And today's first meeting, listeners, we're doing Tender Buttons by Gertrude Stein. Uh, this is a book that I've always wanted to do for the podcast, and I thought it would be great for the first book club meeting because I think, not that Stein doesn't get enough recognition, she gets plenty of recognition, um, but this is like one of her only like published attempts at poetry, and I just thought, like, and I just find it so original and just so kind of out there, especially for the time. Uh, this was originally published in 1914, uh, and uh, Stein herself, I mean... A lot of listeners probably know this, but Stein is just like, was the epicenter of the modernist movement. And that's in poetry, uh, fiction, you know, Picasso was coming over her house all the time to ask her opinion. Like there, she was the mother of 20th century art, hands down. Like, and she literally had her hands in every single pie she is one of the most important figures in literary and artistic history, really. So I figured we'd start this off with giving Stein just her little, like, uh, a little nod to Stein with tender buttons here. Just the name itself, like, tender buttons. Like, (laughs) it, it, I mean, I have this written down, we're going to get to it here, Shay, but it's just like, the sound in this is pushing boundaries. And even that, like, tender buttons. It's like this evocative, like, image and sound and all of that. But as usual, I like to start this off uh, with, uh, what's your history with uh, Gertrude Stein or this book specifically or both or anything or anything else she's written? I know she only had a few books, but. 
Yeah, my um, experience is extremely limited. I only really knew about her um, from the movie A Midnight in Paris, uh, where it had like her and like, you know, F. Scott and Zelda and everybody that like fictional film. But um, and I just know the a rose is a rose is a rose. Who plays her in that? Isn't that? um, um, Oh, I forget her name. uh, It's 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 what's her name? The woman from it's on the the Waterboy tip. plays the Kathy mo- Beats. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she's iconic, like Misery and all that other stuff. Yeah, but yeah. that's about it. Otherwise, like this is, I mean, her actual work is completely foreign to me until recently. And like in that movie, does a good thing. So the Woody Allen movie that they brought up too, like the the Midnight in Paris, where uh it kind of has this writer for those that don't know go back in time to kind of like early 20th century paris and he goes over to gertrude's house and when he's in there he's seeing hemingway he's seeing picasso he's seeing all these different people coming to gertrude for her like opinion on things and and she's she was kind of like the the person that everyone went to to see what do you think of this because People trusted her taste, and I'm going to get to that too, where, you know, I always preach it on this podcast, the taste and judgment, but yeah, my experience with Gertrude is, yeah, just learning about her importance in school and stuff, and I'd never actually read Tender Buttons before, but I've always had it on the list, just uh, little pieces of it here and there, like her little famous quotes, as Shay Lenardi said, like the kind of, a rose is a rose is a rose, but um it's kind of unlike anything else you're going to see, especially for that time period in poetry. Um, so I guess the next question I always like to ask everybody is, uh, how did it read for you? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a very, very humbling experience. I remember like initially when I bought it, I you know, started reading it right away. And just like on the first page, I'm like, okay, like I get the premise of the first one to an extent but like I had to put it down I was just like this I don't know if I like this but then like after I like gave it a break and like dove back in like I I have a like while it's not necessarily my cup of tea um I definitely have like a lot of like respect for it and I understand like the premise of it given the time period for me yeah I have similar like I think it's there's a lot of stuff in this that is doesn't actually work that well I think there's a lot of like kind of failed uh, attempts at something great, but uh, I just, the, I read pretty fast. Like I read through the whole thing in one sitting and I just, I mean, I got, I knew what I was getting into, you know, like, I guess uh, like sure. what, what she was, what her whole thing was with this, but, uh, and it goes towards that modernist kind of idea of like trying to make something new trying to make something different, trying to make something that the world had never seen before. And I mean, that's something that I always stress in my own work, something that I stress to listeners or anybody that like is doing an artistic endeavor. Whereas that's like the kind of originality part, you know, like, and that's incredibly hard to do listeners. I'm not saying everybody should can just do that, but it's just like, at least she's trying to do that, you know, in a book like this, like at least she's trying to just go, absolutely you know balls to the wall uh create something new even like i guess she does that with syntax and she does it in these kind of it's weird because they're not even really set up like poems right like they're kind of like paragraphs yeah Yeah, like prose Mm -hmm. poems but then they're like not even really prose poems they're like straight up like these little sections of 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 sometimes one sentence little thoughts or reflections sometimes repetitive ones that seem as if they're revising themselves as they go along like the chicken section which i want to get to eventually there too oh yeah right yeah and it it, it, for a second there like when i was reading i'm like man this feels like it's like you know like the predictive text if you just keep hitting the middle like it just felt like that a little bit at first like jesus christ but then like i started picking up i'm like okay i think i just need to like read her like truly like in the moment like read like the word in the moment instead of like trying to look back at the last sentence and i feel like i pick it up more that way being as like present like with it as possible yeah and there it's it's 
it's pretty abstract. Would you say it's abstract or did you pick that up or? Certainly. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's just strange too, because uh, when you like go through just the diction in general, like a lot of her verbs are extremely simple, like using just to be like is, was, and then like with her, even just it being like in third person most of the time, like I, I only remember her saying like, I like maybe once or twice and it, like, it's third person so it's like super distant but then at the same time because she's like it's her like subjective like observation of something it's still like her opinion so like ironically it's still like really close to her in a way so i thought that was kind of weird but interesting yeah it's uh it's much different than like kind of contemporary stuff where i always the kind of obsession with the eye is a more recent invention in poetry and then this is like she's i think and i think that's where it fails a lot too i mean we'll get into specific examples listeners as we go on but it's like it's kind of like she was the only goal of this was to subvert and make new and change kind of connotations like there's changing certain feelings or like there's even like definitional kind of uses in this as well like she's trying to change definitions of words and stuff uh and kind of get at a level of depth. And like I said, sometimes I think that fails. Like she doesn't actually get there, oh, but yeah. at least she's trying to do that. And I just, I'm always kind of inspired, like, like picking this up and then reading it. Like I was just absolutely inspired by the kind of balls it took to even try this. <laughs> and I mean, she had people that she was, she could, she was sending this stuff to, I'm sure, you know, and reading it and giving her feedback and stuff like the Ezra Pound and, and stuff like that like she was all up in there with that and uh it just it's incredible that like the risks that this took especially considering her body of work is so small like she didn't do a whole lot of actual art creation she did a whole lot more of like kind of taste and judgment kind of stuff but yeah I'm always fascinated because this is one of those books that is kind of like you either like it or you don't you know definitely yeah i mean i and maybe it's just like i love narrative and like i understand like prose doesn't need narrative and um maybe it's just like the current flavor that i'm in in life right now so it's it's definitely not something i'm into but like i do appreciate and like some of the things that she's doing some of it with just the usage of color kind of gets on my nerves and just like other like little things like i said you know we're gonna do ah! but <laughs> but yeah um i i have mixed feelings about it overall but like I, I feel like i would read like another one of her works just to it's one of those things where it's like i'm not married to it but like i'll get to know it more you know <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think about that, but you mentioned it, it makes me think like, yeah, like this is kind of an acquired taste in terms of what, because some of them are almost bordering on nonsense, you know, like they're almost like nonsense, like clusters of yeah. words. I think the repetition where she's kind of like searching for a rhythm, mm -hmm. almost, almost like song-like, uh, which again, it can be a very powerful tool in a lot of poetry listeners. It can be absolutely mm -hmm. like like really emphasize power and change sometimes it'd be a little long-winded like there's a couple sections that like the last section rooms is just one long poem yeah it's like kind of jumps around uh but then i think there's also just like you know there's there's a big tendency in contemporary poetry to kind of do these associative leaps where they're talking about one thing and then leap to another thing with an association of like some object or some event or something. And I think she's doing that a lot in this, where she's really doing that, um, going into the kind of avant-garde surreal. Like this is one of the most avant-garde poetry collections I think I've ever read. And I mean, that in I, I'm not a big fan of the Dadaists or anything like that. I think that's garbage because I think they were purposely not trying to do anything with that, <laughs> which is bullshit. Um, I guess write in about that. I'm sure I'm going to get some complaints, but yeah, the dot is suck. I'll stay that. Stay <laughs> in there. 
and but this is not like that this is not trying to do nonsense this is trying to do something that we've never seen before and i think that's why it fails a little bit in certain sections like i like there are certain areas that are stronger than others yeah but like most of all it's it's broken into these three sections and any kind of copy you pick up listeners it'll be it's in the public domain so i think you can even get this for free like a pdf online or something where the first section is objects where she just kind of is going through all these different objects like um and then the next section is food which i want to get to because stein was famously kind of a bigger girl right like kind of a someone who enjoyed yeah. their meals and as someone who enjoys their food uh that meant that's really stood out to me uh, and then the final section is rooms, which is basically like one long poem here that like is about being in certain rooms and like the aesthetics, the feelings, the ambiance that you get out of a room like this. Well, I guess let's just get into it then. We'll just go right. Like it starts off with this whole, like there are things in here that I think are just like, there are moments of absolute brilliance mm -hmm. and there's like moments, I think, like I said, of failure but I think the overall themes, let's touch themes first, actually, before we get to specifics. Uh, themes I picked up on, and then, you know, feel free to run with any of these, Shay. Like, uh, usefulness, I think, is a huge theme, mm -hmm. especially in the objects section. And then, interestingly yeah. enough, taste, judgment, uh, I think subversion is a theme in itself. And then I said already definition. And also, I think the kind of, like, the sound in this collection is off the charts just fantastic like she is trying to create these new ways of putting sound into poetry that i have i still don't see anybody in the contemporary world trying to do like it is and it's not rhyme like it's not rhyme and meter it is sound for like sound's sake which is as many know you know the main thing in poetry and it's just kind of like unbelievable like a piece of coffee was the one that <laughs> i was oh uh, yeah really just sound is off the charts glazed glitter mm -hmm. that's i mean the alliteration alone uh but yeah <clears throat> i'd say almost every single poem in this is about like taste and aesthetic and the kind of judgment which i love but yeah what did you think about like anything yeah, you picked um, up on themes, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw like a, a lot of, um, I, I don't know a lot about her. I know like, um, cause I did try to look at her bio a little bit. Like I know she was like a student of psychology and like, I feel like there's a lot of like Freudian, like sexual references in here that she like ropes in a lot. Like it's definitely Freud heavy and just like using, um, especially like in things, like you see a lot of like, I feel like domestic, like references um as well is just like coming up for me mostly oh yeah i mean especially for the sexual references she was famous i mean we i guess we don't know for a fact or do we she was gay uh it's kind of obvious from, from like her biography and stuff but you know it was at a time when you were openly gay you couldn't be openly gay so oh, yeah. uh, especially like that one roast beef that uh like definitely vagina yeah. references and it's full of that and uh how like the vagina is glistening and things and it just kind of absolute uh it's uh, like a lesbian manifesto yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah i'm about it hey <laughs> and uh I, I like that and especially in that food section i think is maybe like the heaviest part of the sexual oh, yeah. innuendos which makes sense because kind of equating food to sex um right you know everybody talks to like seinfeld has that whole bit about it and still like a whole episode about it like with mm -hmm. george getting obsessed with like the pastrami during sex and stuff and eating yeah there there is a correlation between it like there is and i guess it's just like pleasure seeking like just kind of if we wanted to broaden not say just sex but like pleasure seeking and I think sure. eating is like a part of pleasure seeking, like well, gluttony, right? You know, yeah. definitely. Even that, like, I mean, I'm somebody who loves food and eating and there is an immense kind of pleasure you get from it. It's like any of the kind of things it's one of the, I mean, in the 20th century, it's, it's, I mean, it's at least 21st century. Now we, we do, it's so different because food is, 
so apparent it's everywhere like it's very abundant particularly in the u.s here that you don't need to pay a lot of money for it it's everywhere and like the majority of the country's obese like we just love to like gorge ourselves on food and there there is something to that i think of kind of an indulgence or like a (coughs) pleasure in indulging in something like that like and even back then i feel like she was wealthy yeah the touristly like kind of i think she came from a wealthy family and she just kind of had this right. trust fund that she lived on and she had this like townhouse in paris that like, everybody would go over and basically yeah she just sat around and like read books and like wrote books and like ate probably and had like coffee and tea and smoked and cigarettes and uh cigarettes another thing that's about pleasure right and it's interesting too because if we're like granted I, I know like she was american born but like was in paris like through like all this but like uh even just like this was on like the brink of like the suffragette movement as well which i thought was like really interesting for her to come out with something so off the ball and then be a woman on, on top of it you know is always like great to see yeah and i mean i don't know how involved she was in that but uh yeah i'm not sure either I know she didn't give a fuck and she, I mean, well, I guess she cared about appearances and fashion and stuff, but she, she definitely didn't care about, yeah. Like, I mean, you look at something like this, like how kind of the risk she was taking. Cause I imagine, uh, you know, this would get criticized by people that, um, don't understand what she's trying to do with it where they're like, Oh, it's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. But like, she's trying to change sense making itself almost like this kind of, I said subversion as a theme and kind of definition. She's almost, she's changing definition or at least trying to with some of this. Yeah. And I'm just curious on what her like editing process was or if like how much of that was even involved or was it like before the beats made it famous, the whole, you know, stream of consciousness writing. That's also something I'm curious about that I don't like really know about her. Yeah, there's a lot of stream of consciousness in this, too. There's a lot of yeah. uh, association with that, too. Like, I'm guessing, you know, the big one, Virginia Woolf, which we covered on this pod, mm-hmm. listeners, right? Like, she was a master of that. And that makes it sometimes, I know readers struggle with this, too. Sometimes it makes it difficult to read when you're doing the stream of consciousness and you're just jumping from, like, internal monologue to internal monologue it really makes it difficult to read and i always struggle with that uh modernists love that and i mean so it makes sense that she's trying to like participate in that too i really i mean a lot of novel writing is that now too or a lot of not so much poetry really but novel writing right now they're still kind of doing that but not as kind of masterfully I always say, like, Virginia Woolf used, like, every tool in the toolbox to really make that special. And she did these short little novels that were just so honed and crafted. I imagine she crafted it. I mean, I don't know. Any listeners that know can put it in the comments or something. But it's like, I imagine she was very much, you know, like, like... editing the shit out of this or rewriting uh even though it might not seem like it in some cases but i think it's all very intentional especially the kind of repeated For parts sure. even if they don't work like i think there's parts that just don't work yeah. at all but what uh what stood out to you at first reading through like which like particular poems or just like generally yeah anything poems um, or I mean, the, style yeah. or yeah like the the first thing too was just like uh because like nothing in this at least at first glance um when you're trying to go through it like a lot of it is is not really linear at all so like it was a bit difficult at first um and just trying to find like the purpose versus like the actual like objectivity of like what she's saying um because some of it is just ramblings but then some of it if we like i had to reread some of it but some of it like if you really pay attention to some keywords you kind of like would get what she was getting at um let me see here like maybe 
Was there I'm like a disgust like, or anything when you were reading it? Like a disgust factor? Um, I think it was like it was more like honestly. Word? Yeah. No, it, I don't think it was disgust. I it was more like honestly, dude, it was like imposter syndrome. I was like, <laughs> I know this is famous. What is wrong with me? Like, I do I like is this like a different? Like, I just I was like, okay, like. I need to do some freaking learning and I, I just had to put it down for like a week. And then I was like, you know what? Like, let's just do it as in the moment as possible. Um, but a lot of it for me was just like the type of verbs she was using, like not really using like super like active voice. Like it was just, everything was like, this is this and this is that it was so like definitive. Um, so like, I just found it like kind of interesting because like obviously nowadays at least like what I'm taught in school is to like avoid that at all costs and like instead of making things just is this is that like you know always trying to find like a more powerful verb to the whole show not tell of it all so that was like one of the biggest things that like at first like stuck out to me in general yeah <clears throat> I get that and I think it, it's difficult to like when you're reading something like this, because like a novel that's doing something like this, you could kind of eventually learn how to read it. But this doesn't really establish like a pattern or anything that you can kind of latch on to and be like, oh, I see what they're doing. It's like, uh, it's wild. Like, that's what I think I got kind of exhilarated reading this because it was just, it's so wild. It's so out there. Like she was one of the first really avant-garde poets to try and do this even if it fails at times it's like i just admire that so much i admire that like she's because you know I, i've been working on this essay <clears throat> and this is a scoop for listeners and all that and where i'm i'm talking about how we don't even know what the avant-garde looks like right now like people don't even know what it is and they keep referring to the avant-garde of the 1960s and 70s and saying, oh, that's avant-garde. But that was 50 years ago. Like, that was the avant-garde 50, 60, 70 years ago. And this is the avant-garde 120, you know, 100 years ago, 110 years ago. Like, I always just kind of, I'm, I'm like, where is this stuff? Where is the avant-garde art actually happening? Uh, and I the whole reason I started writing this, did you see Bo is Afraid? That uh, Ari Aster movie? Mm -hmm. Oh my god. I didn't see it until like it came out on like Showtime, but like uh, like after it was released in theaters. And it's three hours. And it was kind of one of those things that like, I had heard a lot of mixed things about it. And a lot of movie critics that I really like and, and trust and admire didn't like it. But just mm -hmm. watching it, and I like sat there and three hours was engrossed. And at the end of it, I was just thinking to myself, I have to write an essay about this. This is the newest avant garde thing I've ever seen. Like Ari Aster oh, wow. just like did avant garde for the 21st century. He just showed us like a new avant garde technique in film that like, that like everybody was just kind of going, oh, that's not it again, because they keep thinking that avant garde is what you know people were doing in the seventies or sixties or something, or even yeah the modernists in the twenties and like the early nineteen tens, and it's just like, no, that was the avant garde then, and it's actually the avant garde from the seventies. I would say is absolutely mainstream art now. It's not even avant garde. It's it's absolutely mainstream, like people do you know whatever there's you see all these pop artists mm -hmm. now doing this kind of anti-religious stuff where they're dressed as nuns or devils and they're like biting heads off of shit blood like kind of this sacrilegious stuff it's like yeah that was something that happened like almost 70 years ago in this kind of bold new art forms that people were doing and it was actually risky then too because you know the church had a lot of fucking power culturally and politically and like right. you know even thinking back to like Sinead O'Connor ripping up that picture of the Pope on SNL, people flipped out. Like, but like that was oh, yeah. bold. So, but now somebody did that, like nobody would give a shit. Like that isn't risky. That is an avant-garde. It's been done. It was done, you know, 35 years ago now. And it's just kind of like, I guess what I'm trying to say is I just found this refreshing, like just kind of how wild it was, how, how much it was trying to do something, like, even, even if it sucks, like, even if you're swinging for the fences and you miss, 
I just admire that so much in, in art making, particularly poetry. And I did get like Berryman vibes and stuff like that. I did get like the vibes of great poets that I had admired that came after this. And I think that there's, that's not an accident, you know, like that's definitely. Oh, sure. Yeah. Something that <clears throat> I was picking up on. Maybe it's just me or whatever, but. And then there was one thing I was just like reading about her in general. And apparently, and I'm not too familiar with the term. Like I know it in like actual art, but she was trying to say that like, especially because she's so influenced by like Matisse and like Picasso um, was that this was essentially like a written version of cubism. Yes. Which I, I found kind of interesting because even just going with like with the carafe because it's like a kind a kind in glass and a cousin a spectacle and nothing strange. Um, it's like you're starting inside of the actual craft and like going out when you're like reading like the word associations in there because um, she's like the difference is spreading at the end and it was just kind of like a weird way because it's not like you're necessarily looking at it like on every single little side, but it's like, she's starting like within and spreading out. And I thought that was really interesting. It was a really strong, like first poem at least. Cause I was like, okay, this is a little different, but like, I think I pick up what she's putting down, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love that you say that with, it's like, <clears throat> it is, it is this kind of cubism and the kind of modernist art that was going on. Like you can tell she was inspired by more than just the poets and stuff and poetry that was happening in fiction. She was inspired by these artists that were doing things people hadn't seen before that were actually taking things that could be considered ugly and trying to do stuff with them. Like, 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 uh, abstractness, not for abstractness sake, but abstractness to, to create some form of beauty. But yeah. Right. Especially, yeah, Glaze Glitter was the first one that stood out to me. And, it, and she does this a lot, like that first nickel, what is nickel? It is originally rid of a cover. And there's kind of this, what is this? You know, she'll say the term and then ask, what is it? And that's where I get the kind of definition thing. Right. And just like the change in that is that red weakens an hour. The change has come. There is no search, but there is, there is that hope and that interpretation. And sometime, surely any is unwelcome. Sometime there is breath. And there will be a sinecure and charming, very charming, is that clean and cleansing. And then my favorite line in this, certainly glittering is handsome and convincing. Right. Certainly glittering is handsome and convincing. Oof. Oof. And the way that, that she kind of, like, I don't know, what do you think of that line? Certainly glittering is handsome and convincing. Um. No, I mean, I think it's a good line. Um. Like, are you asking, like, what I, like, think of it, like, definitively? Or? Just whatever you I mean, get. I, I, first thing that comes to mind or, or, yeah, what do you think it's saying or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I was just, like, thinking of, like, the time period and just, like, being so close, like, leading up to, like, World War One and everything. And just, like, nickel and, like, the value of money and, like, certainly glittering is handsome and convincing. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just getting just, like about like the economy in general and like what is worth to us was kind of my vibe but yeah the kind of sparkling jewels money uh crystal glassware considering we're in the kind of the object section of this book the very first section it's like so literally it's just these kind of objects uh the mm -hmm. carafe in the first one a cushion in the one after this the kind of glazed glitter and this kind of I think, yeah, it's certainly glittering is handsome and convincing. And I think it is kind of convincing you of its value, right? Gold glittering, silver glittering, crystal glittering, um, diamonds, you know, uh, these things that we put immense value on. And it's almost like uh, uh, she's kind of giving us that acknowledgement of it. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what I, yeah, I got something similar from it. Yeah, there is no gratitude in mercy and in medicine, <laughs> oh i love it yeah uh and yeah, then the... that's when it makes sense because it transitions there and you're like oh okay cool where are we getting with this she's like trust fundy it's like all right but yeah and i think it just hits at something like there is no gratitude in mercy and in medicine and i mean it's yeah. a little abstract because the medicine tacked on at the end there but it's also like there's no gratitude in mercy and I think that's also, I mean, this is what we always talk about with art, these kind of universal truths, these kind of 
things that hit at some vein in the in the, the common humanity that they whenever you you know mercy is often treated with ingratitude or 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 uh they just take advantage of it or something in a lot of ways but yeah uh it certainly showed the last line of this is one of my favorites uh, it certainly showed no obligation, and perhaps if borrowing is not natural, there is some use in giving. <coughs> perhaps if borrowing is not natural. I had that underlined because I was just like, oh, yes. Borrowing is not natural. There is some use in giving. Yeah, and I think also, like, whatever I was just like reading this in my head I was it was like a little hard but then like when I would read it aloud and like it helped me like break it down a lot more too kind of like when you're doing drafts and writing it was kind of like the same thing I was able to kind of like pick up other stuff as well and see how it was actually more cohesive than I had like originally like realized yeah and I wasn't crazy about a substance and a cushion uh there was just like one line in particular that I liked uh, out of the whole, and that's one of her longer ones in this first section, where, uh, what is the use of a violent kind of delightfulness yep. if there is no pleasure in not getting tired of it? Yeah, I had that underlined too. And it goes with that kind of what we talked about already, like she was food, smoking, drinking, uh, monetary indulgences, uh, fashion, uh, uh, all of that. What is the use of a violent kind of delightfulness? there is no pleasure in not getting tired of it fantastic but i really want to talk about a piece of coffee uh that was one of my favorites and this is one where i just thought that like uh sound was kind of going off the charts where like Mm -hmm. she was just really going going all the way with it uh oh yeah she likes alliteration that's for sure yeah a piece of coffee is not a detainer the resemblance to yellow is dirtier and distincter. The clean mixture is whiter and not coal color. Never more coal color than altogether. Never more coal color than altogether. Just like poof, popped off in my head where I was just like, this woman is a master. Like this woman is just hearing these things click together and putting them on the page, even if they don't make sense, which could be kind of the cubism influence and stuff. But like never more coal color than altogether. And just like the way that hit me, I just couldn't get over it. Yeah. Cause it's like, obviously like black is a shade. So like, I get like why she's saying not coal color and like white is like all color. So like when I went back to thinking of how she was talking about how this was like cubism, like a literal, like a writing version of it, essentially. Like I was just also like reading this and just thinking of like a palette and like, okay, she's literally mixing these colors and like, speaking it instead of you know sitting there and mixing up with a palette knife and throwing it on a canvas and the reference of coffee right coal color Mm -hmm. and a piece of coffee like a piece of coal but a piece of coffee right and you can have like either a coffee bean or whatever it is and i think that's supposed to be a little abstract as well like yeah that's what i assumed yeah but yeah, I just couldn't get over that line. It's one of my favorites. I'll get to my favorite line in this ever, but never more cold color than all together. Where, yeah, when you're talking about that palette being smeared all together. Never more cold color than all together. The sight of a reason, the same sight slider, the sight of a simpler negative answer, the same sore sounder, the intention to wishing, the same splendor, the same furniture. Again, that kind of, that is so sound forward like and this is what made me think of like the dream songs and stuff too even though this is you know many years before that i just (laughs) unbelievable level of of making these sounds click together i know there's like i had a teacher who would always say like the most beautiful kind of like sound in the english language is like cellar door and I was always thinking, like, eh, I don't know if I agree with that, but never more cold color than altogether. I just like, ooh, that might be one of the best <laughs> sounding things. <clears throat> and it kind of creates a rush. Like, are you you're into Ginsburg, right? Like Hal. Mm-hmm. And I know Hal is like inspired by Whitman stuff, but I'm sure you know Stein was reading Whitman as well. And just kind sure. of that the 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 when you have these long sentences that just keep building and repeating. 
it does add a kind of urgency to them. Like that section I read about the sight of a reason. It just, it just, I mean, there's something that it creates in your head when you read through it. And some of this stuff you do have yeah. to read out loud, like, like to really get what she's mm -hmm. going for. Especially with that one, because it's so like comma heavy, that specific line, it, it, it does urge you, like, even though you don't have like, you know, your, um, I can't think of the word right now, but you know, like your line breaks or whatever, um, enjambments and, uh, it forces you to breathe so it it does kind of like make you feel that's that like with that, that faster pace or whatever it does give you that sense of urgency yeah i wanted to ask you I, would you call these prose poems yeah yeah i would just because it doesn't like at least like my general understanding of prose is that like it doesn't like it doesn't have a goal and there isn't like a conflict so since it's not a story it's prose and there's no like yeah line structure other than like a paragraph basic paragraph structure. But I was right. I was I guess I was tossing this back and forth because I was like, all right, like a lot of them I would say yes, are they seem like they prose poems, but then some of them seem like they're kind of half formed. Like she's almost mm -hmm. playing with the prose poem form too. Like uh, some of the oh, one yeah. sentence ones Maybe, I mean, that was big in modernist stuff. Everybody points to Ezra Pound, you know, people at the Metro or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, I couldn't quite decide if if I was calling these pros or maybe even, like, creative essay type. I mean, I don't know, because they're not quite essays either. They're not. Yeah, because it's, it's just so spatial, you know, in, like, a sense. Like, it doesn't have, like... I mean, it's it's just so like subjective because they're just viewing something and like they're it's it's just kind of like inner ramblings on a page and it's just really pretty ones <laughs> in a sense. And I just think like that's why I say it's it's so much of it is about taste and judgment. Mm -hmm. Like she's making judgments about aesthetic and stuff, like <clears throat> with the colors and stuff, the references to um uh. We we get to um, my favorite line in this whole thing. Any little bit of green is ordinary, and uh, mm -hmm. and just like the, the the artistic and aesthetic judgments that are being put in all of these. Even coffee, like a piece of coffee, like is about a couple of different things. But I think it's about also the kind of judging, like what it looks like, what it feels like, like what it gives you. Um, right. And then kind of just basic descriptions and definitions, too. <clears throat> I think that's, like, all there. And that's where I think mm -hmm. the poetics really come in uh, in terms of, yeah, whether they're prose poems or not. It's kind of like, yeah, but these are incredibly poetic. And they're yeah. not trying to tell a story so much <clears throat> as, like, get an idea across. And really that idea is about, like, an aesthetic idea or a judgment and I always stress mm -hmm. this, like, I always stress, like, you have to judge something like, I, like, there's this tendency where everyone's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, no, like, what do you think? Like, make a judgment, like, like, mm -hmm. you know, anybody can make a judgment, even if it's not that like, a, oh, a super informed judgment or whatever, like you can make a judgment and you can say, what do you think of this? And it, it's clearly she had no lack of confidence in doing that and that's why people came to her all the time like for her judgment and then this is kind of like that in poetic form i don't know i mean that's just what i was like seeing. no i get it yeah definitely it's it's very like i mean it's just a lot of observation you know and just her point because everyone has like with judgment like everyone when they see something they have some sort of observation of whatever they're looking at like some sort of perception whether they want to say it out loud or not whether it's positive negative or even just in between and like nihilistic like everyone has some form of perception and this is just her extension of that and there's like <clears throat> good manners <clears throat> usually makes people not like say the judgment sure but like the people that are unafraid to say the judgment like stein are it's almost like a trust like you develop a trust through it 
because there is this mm-hmm. level of, you know, everyone says no judgment, but I always am like, you know, you're judging things constantly. Right. Like when I see somebody on the street, like I'm judging them. I mean, I don't necessarily say anything or whatever, but like just internally or like, I'm not even thinking about it that hard, you know, but it's just like, you see somebody, what somebody looks like, what somebody's doing, like the way they walk. Like, I'm always just like, huh? Like I just like see it. And then you're like, like, there's an inherent judgment to it and uh, right kind of like mindfulness sometimes you're just observing something even without bias it's just something you're seeing and then she's just describing it from her perspective and i guess it, it does shift a little bit whereas like this section is objects mm-hmm. and so there's all these different objects that she, literal objects listeners so mildred's umbrella a red stamp a box uh, a plate, uh, a seltzer bottle, a long dress, a red hat, a blue coat, a piano, a chair. Uh, and But then there's like more abstract stuff, a frightful release. Mm-hmm. Like like these kind of like, it, it just, making I like that, nothing elegant too. Yeah, and like making yeah. that a, uh, uh, something like an object, a frightful release. But it is kind of about about an object too. But it's like you know, right? A bag which was left. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's fun too because it's like when you're reading some of these, you're as you're going through it, you're trying to connect it to like the title, and then sometimes she does like the inverse of that, which is nice because then that kind of mixes it up too, and it's not so routine in a sense. So I do like that. Yeah, and there's this line in a chair what I thought kind of summed up the theme of, of judgment and kind of taste as well, where it says, the main action is that without a blaming, there is no custody. The main action is, yeah, there is no yeah. custody. Meaning like, what I took it to mean is that, that without this action, without this taste of judgment, this act of judging, this act of description and interpreting there is that without a blaming there is no custody so like you have no kind of agency over anything without this 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 judgment or taste being imposed otherwise you know you're just kind of it's just a thing that like you you, you're just going about i don't want to say like mpc like a mean term like a like a non-playing character but uh sure it is kind of like yeah like without blame there without a blaming there is no custody no ownership no integrity to it Mm -hmm. i mean she was just being a genius in a lot of these i mean and then i think a lot of these don't work too so like when she gets into the kind of these one sentence things like a new cup and saucer enthusiastically hurting a clouded yellow bud and saucer enthusiastically so is the bite and the ribbon it just they seem kind of like half formed or just not doing what she wanted them to do eyeglasses i also just cutlet. liked it was kind of whimsical too i think just because like uh sorry for cutting out but like i actually did kind of like that one with as simple as it is now like there's other ones that are like like eyeglasses i wasn't like super keen on but like that one i just kind of liked because it made me think about mindfulness and like this big trend on like slow living that like everybody talks about and just like you know maybe like the whatever she had whether it be like chamomile or whatever the yellow bud was or whatever just like something that just like the tannins were just set in a little too long and i don't know i just thought it was kind of (laughs) cute yeah and i think that's that's i think you're right she is going for something there like it is like it's not entirely without purpose and you can see what she's going for too with these kind of Mm -hmm like what it represents like a new cup and saucer like the enthusiasm right Mm -hmm. just the beauty and like the simplicity you know yeah and i guess we should touch on the one called objects just because it's like you know this section is called objects said within within the cut and slender joint alone with sudden equals and no more than three two in the center make two one side something like that like, if the elbow is long and it is filled, so then the best example is all together. The kind of show is made by squeezing. 
And I think that kind of sums it up too, squeezing, feeling the object. Like literally, I, I think it's a romantic sense. Like it is, it's romanticizing these objects and not just for like their usefulness, oh, but like what they can mean to you, you know, like, like, like I always, I mean, I have, I think everybody does this where there's just these little things that are almost meaningless, like these, an object I got for whatever reason. And I just hold on to it for years. Like, and there's not even like a story behind it. And I just can't get rid of it for some reason. Like I just always, like I'm moving recently, like I'm packing up to move in the next few weeks. And it's like, you find those things and I'm like, man, I've had this for years and it's just absolutely mm -hmm. like I've, I've never gotten rid of it. It's not even like I pull it out and look at it. I just like to possess it. Like it's. Oh yeah. I'm someone who loves antiquing. <laughs> like I own too much old stuff with some sort of story I don't know about, but there's something kind of, you know, fun about that. And just like when I think of squeezing, I think of like warmth and like, kinetic energy so like i even took kind of something a little almost sexual about that too just like longing yeah it fetishizing the thing like kind of like like giving it right. more meaning than it has and i mean this section like this section is called objects the Freud of it all yeah and like it's yeah. giving these objects more meaning than they have and kind mm -hmm. of making i love romanticizing like i I think as an as a mm -hmm. writer, as a poet, as and any, all you out there listening know this, and Shayla knows this. It's like th this is that's the whole point. Like if you can't romanticize the tiniest little thing, like a little tuft mm -hmm. in a carpet, like it just kind of, you know, what are you doing? Because that is a huge part of the art, and and I love that she's doing it in this. Like especially when we get to the food section, the way she's kind of romanticizing these kind of pleasurable aspects of uh food and all that i think there is like a there's something like really brilliant to that too when you find like mundane objects like this and just like essentially restore it in a in a way that like it's actually like a lot more magical than you had maybe like originally like perceived it to be i think is like a really strong way to like show like you're a good writer whether like we can argue about like narratives whatever if that's your thing but like when it comes down to it like taking something and like bringing magic or life to something inanimate, I, I think is like really touching. Yeah. I mean, even like, yeah, a little bit of a tumbler, like, so, I mean, implies like some type of like peace or something, mm -hmm. uh, a shine indication of yellow consists in there having been more of the same color than could have been expected when all four were bought. This was the hope which made the six and seven have no use for any more places. And this necessarily spread into nothing, spread into nothing. It right. is kind of like necessarily spread into nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that these kind of yeah, I just can't get over this these these objects, these things. Like, was there anything that you wanted to touch on that uh, I, we didn't talk about yet, or in this uh, section? right before? Yeah, like right before Tumblr, uh, I just wanted your opinion um, on malachite because, like, I love malachite in like the stone that it is like it's one of my favorite stones and like i like the mythology that surrounds it but i just couldn't understand the context with the title and maybe that's part of the problem because the sudden spoon is the same in no size the sudden spoon is the wound in the decision like it sounds good but i'm just like i don't really know what she's exactly getting at yeah i would say yeah i mean for that i would say it's one of the ones that's not quite working i mean yeah where I think it is kind of the shorter ones that tend to not work as well. <clears throat> yeah. At least like the other ones, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it sounds good. The sudden spoon is the same and no size. The wound in the decision. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. What did you get out of it? What did you think when you were? I, yeah, it, honestly just kind of stumped me and i was just curious honestly on what your opinion was of it well i guess spoon can mean so many different things with right there are so many different um the most i mean now in the you know what we associate it with like the kind of silverware but mm -hmm. isn't there like a term in sewing with that as well with spoon like 
I mean, there's spool, but I, I don't, I'm not sure. And then, um, obviously there could be like the kind of romantic sense of spooning, but I don't think she means it that way. Uh, I think that might be a more modern. Yeah. Uh, use well, it's just the... like the Malachite is what throws me off just because of with like, I don't know, like how like necessarily like woo she was with like that stone or anything like that or she was into that kind of stuff um so i i was trying to like compare it to that in like a more ethereal sense but i could get it to connect but it's fine is there I was um... curious because it means like transformation so i'm like i don't know if she's talking about some like the spoon and like curves and like the defined feminine but i was like really reaching there so i don't know is um uh is there like a mythical reference to it that stone isn't there usually some type of yeah and i i think it just depends on like what your belief systems are and stuff like that but i think it's generally known as like a stone of like transformation and like new beginnings so i'm like the only thing i could think of is like a wound a decision like it sounds to me like me if, if i'm really reaching here with the malachite and the transformation like this is have to talk about like the life cycle and like birth to something and like making new change that's the only thing i could i feel like it's reaching but that's the only thing i could think of it and then sometimes when i was like going through this i'm like okay, i can find some really deep stuff in this but am i also just like i don't know am i also just like conspiring how profound some of it is because like that like it could really she could be literal and i have no idea or she could be talking about something that i'm just theorizing but i think maybe that's kind of the fun in it is it's kind of its own like some of this stuff it's kind of like your own perspective as well you're looking at it with her through her lens so yeah i think so i think it can be whatever you want it to mean in a lot of ways but i, I was just curious but... if it was like some oculate or, or occult like uh Thing. But if you said it represents transformation, it makes sense to like, like the sudden spoon. So the sudden, this is suddenly a spoon or right. the act. Could it even be used as like a verb is to literally to spoon something out or something mm -hmm. is the same in no size kind of diminishing right. the kind of suddenness or the transformation. And then there's the repetition. The sudden spoon is the wound and the decision. Yeah, that's what I, that second sentence is, like, what I, like, really, like, hang on to with, like, the meeting. The wound and the decision, because it's a sudden spoon. So, I don't know. And I guess that's what makes it fun. Um, what do you think it is? I mean, wound and the decision is, like, okay, that makes more sense than the sudden spoon. Right, because the sudden spoon is the wound and the decision. So, it's, like... The fact that something is so sudden, you don't have time to really contemplate. And that's something that, like, also kind of, um, what is the word? Kind of, I mean, literal wounding you. Like, like, that's kind of like the wound, in a sense, with your own decision making. Because, like, you don't really have time to, like, you just have to react. Or, like, some, like, a decision that was made and then something wounded it, right? Made it, like, difficult or different or made you change it. And I'm thinking almost right. now, too, the literal, like, the sudden spoon and maybe even, like, the surface of a sugar bowl or something. Maybe I'm kind of pulling this out of other sections, like the sugar section. Sure. Right. But, like, you know, it would be, like, an obtrusive object, almost like a wound in the smooth surface. And maybe there was, like, a decorative stone in it. I don't know. I mean, she had money. She probably had all kinds of fancy silverware and, like, teaspoons and... For real. Things yeah. like that. Just the impulse, right? But, yeah, that was the the one thing that kind of stuck at me because I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means. And then, like, I liked in between. But, um, and I had some other stuff just kind of randomly underlined obviously peeled pencil choke i mean that's pretty phallic um but yeah and then the whole roast beef thing which we kind of already touched on oh no that's food now just kidding i'm skipping that <laughs> all right yeah food i'm good and i guess it is just kind of avant-garde way to describe it too wait which one did you say about the phallic uh the peeled pencil choke and that's towards the end right mm-hmm yeah, yeah. Rub, rub her coke right i'm like okay that's pretty blatant asexual um 
it's just more of just me reading it in the present and then i was just like like how much of like the complexity was like made with purpose you know but i mean you could say that subjectively with like every single thing in here that was just like a random note i just put at the end of each section since it's not like the they're really like numbered or anything since they're just all their section i try to put stuff in between and then try to write down page numbers and stuff <clears throat> yeah it's for listeners that haven't read it it does kind of just go through one after the other there's like maybe a little title thing and then it just keeps going one of there's no page difference it's not like separating them it's connecting them even the only real separation mm -hmm. are the sections you know objects food and then rooms are like the this only thing that separates the kind of sections or themes but it is and i think you make a good point like it is meant to kind of jumble it all together it's almost like all the things she mentions in this you could just be sitting in like an old drawing room or something at that time in that old Paris house, townhouse. And like, you could look around the room and each one of these things you could see, you know, a coffee set up, a spoon, a book, shoes, um, tables, shawl, peeled pencil. Right. And then I think, yeah, like the parts that don't quite work as well are like, I, I think I can see that she's trying to do something and then maybe doesn't quite get there and then just says, ah, oh, screw it, and then moves to the next one, you know? And I think mm -hmm. she kind of intentionally left those in there too because, I mean, there is value in the attempt, and you know, like maybe there's an overemphasis now in per in mm -hmm. perfection or, or not including failed poems in collections or something as you're moving through. I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking of that now. Right. And I think, um, and I wish I wrote this down, but it's, it's in the back of my head. There's like a few poems too, where she uses the word earnest. And like, at the same time, I'm like, I wonder if that's why, like some of the ones that I don't really resonate with. Um, I wonder if she like maybe felt the same way with some of these as well, but she felt it was still necessary to leave in just for the sake of like that like proposed earnesty that's interesting too do you think that these are earnest like there's like an earnesty to these or do you think that they're like joking they're, poking i think they're earnest of? to her but even if it's joking or poking fun it's still like earnest to her like perception and observation <laughs> so i would say it is yeah i would thinking of that now when you mentioned it i i think I feel like she's actually blurring that line in this kind of there's earnesty to this. And then there's also kind of a joke or mocking or mm -hmm. like maybe a little bit of that Dada spirit where the nonsense sure. angle and maybe that's like an artistic angle that I didn't consider before of what she's doing here with these because it is she's definitely having fun with it. Yeah. Yeah, it is just i mean i I mean it is kind of like i i mean you know i've never really read anything like this before or since you know like there's really very few things that kind of evoke that kind of in-between blurry feeling that this book does mm -hmm. and these kind of collection of these little strings of stuff sometimes they're not even working yeah and i think that's a big thing too with like um and, and i know like Picasso has had like several like phases of course but just like with surrealism like in general like a lot of it is like up to one's own interpretation so I mean I guess it's just it just goes back to like what speaks true to us but this is how at least from my understanding of like when I read it this is her honest way of observing it whether it's you know poking fun or or whatever it's at least i'm assuming her opinion especially just all of like the uh like homosexual like eroticism which you'll really see in food but yeah yeah well i gotta pee and why don't we take a little break get a refill and then we'll move on to food real Sounds quick good. yeah be right back cool. Oh, this beer is hitting the spot, too. Hey. What are you drinking? Uh, this chocolate stout. Oh, snap. I usually keep uh, 
heavier stuff for like the colder months. That's interesting. Uh, I don't even really drink beer that often. Uh, my, oh, okay. My wife is currently pregnant, but when she drinks, she always likes to get kind of seasonal stuff. So I actually have some summer stuff in like the mango cart. Beer is big in summer. Oh yeah. So there's uh you know, I could have been drinking that, but I was just I don't really like sweet drinks, like especially alcohol. Really I don't like any type of sweet beverage. Maybe chocolate milk is as sweet as it goes for me. Uh but I don't know, I've just yeah, it was been a stressful day and I was just like, Yeah, this actually is a maybe I'll just drink this and I'm out of scotch. And I didn't want to buy more yeah, because yeah. It would, uh, we are moving and I just have to pack up some one more thing to pack. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> I mean, whenever I do stuff like this, when I disrupt my environment, it takes me a good three to six months to get reacclimated to a new environment. Like, uh, oh, so absolutely. it's always a pain in the ass for me whenever I'm having to do this kind of stuff. So I get even more stressed when I'm having to change my environment or like, I just finished packing up most of my books and of course I have, you know, stuff scheduled. So not just the book club scheduled, but like other episodes where people are coming on or I'm doing a solo episode and I'm like, all right, I had to leave those out and I had to like really prepare all that stuff so that I'm not like packing up books that I needed in like these boxes. But yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah, moving sucks. Then you're you're doing this plus you're also teaching, which is I'm sure its own headache. And then you know the stresses of of just you know the whole process of the pregnancy. Congratulations, by the way, is it your first? Nice. Do you know the gender yet? Yeah, it's a girl. Awesome. Congrats. That's exciting. Yeah, she's due uh, in September, so we've been uh dealing with that like doctor's appointments and stuff but but i'm loving this so far yeah <clears throat> and then next time we got to go more fiction per, like style sure yeah i'm pretty much down for anything i mean i think what's most fun for me is that like uh especially something like this was like really intimidating and um i just like the learning experience too you know so i'm open to whatever and you don't hear it like this is a book that like I was never taught in school. It was only ever no. referenced a few times. Like there was never any like, oh, read this. And then like when you sit down and actually read it, which is what I always encourage listeners to do, read the books. There is this like it's almost like I said, it's wild. It's like free and it's unlike anything else that was kind of written at that time, especially in terms of poetry think of the high modernists like you think of Eliot and all of that but you never think of Stein you never think of her what she's doing in this book is resembles the more kind of mid to late 20th century than it does the current time period in 1914 when she published this and I'm like all right so that means that this was more ahead of its time than Eliot anything anything Eliot did or anything these other high modernist poets did Oh uh, absolutely and it became the norm and you would think that because of that especially looking back now and of course you'd be able to easily assign this and have people go through it in that way but never happens i mean there's a sad state for kind of education especially literary education right now with that but i'm glad i read it and i'm glad we did it for this because it is it's it's inspiring like whenever i do something like like i like things that are not the norm things that are going off the edge a little bit and this does that you know like this really mm -hmm. this isn't some confessional i mean confessional hadn't even really been a thing yet this is right. this is uh abstract kind of avant-garde um evolution in poetry writing that's why i always stress the dream songs with barryman if like if you look 
back at those poems, like nobody has come close to that level of innovation in the art form. And like, she doesn't even really properly get the credit for the innovation with this stuff here. I mean, who was writing prose poems at that time? Like almost no one. Right. And then to do it and in I this think... way. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, <clears throat> one thing I was gonna say too, is that I feel like maybe the lack of popularity as well is, um, you know, it's not easy to mimic, right? You know what I mean? like good luck trying to recreate something like this i mean i guess if you sat there and did like a free write in your room and looked at something but to still try to connect dots you know within that and like because even and i don't and i know we're over things but even just little things like um where was it sorry just a second because i was like the red stamp while like they started talking about lilies and then like brought in dirt so it's like a way she's using things that are like relative to the subject matter so it's like pseudo metaphorical but like not quite i don't know there's just so many different like things she's doing it's like a codex honestly but that's what makes it entirely original at the same time yes i mean that's the art like that is the innovative part of the art like like yeah. I know I always shit on Instagram poetry and all that and uh, everybody else should too, but it's just like <clears throat> those are so expected. Those are the reason those are bad usually is, you know, all the other reasons. But the main thing that irritates me is that it's not original. It's not new. It's not anything that you couldn't read in an emo song lyric or anything from 30 years ago. And it is kind of like, you know, that it causes a stagnation in the art. And, you know, whatever, it's hard to be innovative. It's hard to do that. I'm not saying it's easy. Even in Stein here, we've already talked about a few things that, like, fail. It doesn't quite work all the time. But, like, right. you know, those innovations really, even if they don't catch on right away, well, 20, 30 years later, like, they do catch on and, and people start to emulate it character work and stuff whereas right now it's kind of an obsession with either confessional or narrative work and uh <clears throat> i like that she just doesn't do that and again it wasn't a big time then that they weren't really doing i guess elliot was doing right. narrative but like they weren't doing a whole lot of narrative or confessional didn't even really exist it was still kind of passe to do that <clears throat> but mm -hmm. uh although i guess there's you know there's some confession to kind of all do art doing that but sure yeah let's uh let's move to the food section and this was my favorite section of the book probably um one because i said i already like food is great i love food i love turning mm -hmm. it into poetry i like the fact that you because food is such a huge part of living and we talked about not just like an indulgence like you know rich foods and she was wealthy so she was able to have all these rich foods and like fruits and stuff all the time especially at mm -hmm. that time uh post world war one I, I guess or right at the beginning of world war one yeah um in paris and it just and i guess the french were famous for the kind of indulgent dishes like the most complex pastries and stuff are usually French. Oh yeah. French patissiers. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of British bake off. I'm just like an idiot here, but Hey, it's a guilty pleasure. And there's just, it's just so like tedious. Just every little detail like, is just so like intricate and like everything like serves a purpose. Um, and you yeah. think about that. Part of that is because the French dominated at that time, a lot of part of the globe and you had to have this level of indulgence to even be able to do that. Like, you know, to be able to refrigerate or ice down butter before you're mixing it into something because that affects oh, how yeah. it's baked is a luxury, you know, a huge luxury, especially if you go all the way back 1700s, 1800s, like this is a huge luxuries that you can only have with these kind of empire states that uh again created these innovations and the kind of what you get out of it and then we all still enjoy it to this day 
you know, hundreds of years later. But I like that food is included. And we already said this, Snine is kind of, was kind of a bigger girl, kind of a tubby girl. She didn't shy away from these indulgences. And I guess back then it probably was still like like being fatter was like a sign of wealth still. Like, uh, as opposed to now where a sign of wealth is like being thin. Uh, and like, your Botox, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, it's like all the poor people are all like morbidly obese now, and like at least in the Western world, America, and then uh, uh, all the rich people are just like thin on like steroids or something, and uh, it's uh, it's like a sign of wealth now to be like in shape. It's almost done the total inverse. But yeah, <clears throat> food, and this section is the longest section in the book as well. Uh, which again says something and it isn't just quite you know it isn't so simple either of just like roast beef it's much deeper than that but food and sexual mm -hmm. pleasure which we've been getting to um but yeah roast beef what did, what did you think of roast beef yeah i mean it is definitely for me at least like it, super sexual um definitely like lusting let me going on here um i would say it's a lesbian manifesto that's definitely still like my my five second take on that <laughs> if i was just to sum it up there it is kindness is not earnest okay it's yeah it's it's in the middle of a uh, tender buttons but anyway and this is probably the longest poem well besides rooms is probably the longest but this is the longest poem in this section right <clears throat> roast yeah. beef and uh you say okay the poem's called roast beef but it doesn't even start with like a food thing it says in the inside yeah. there is sleeping in the outside there is reddening in the morning there is meaning in the evening there is feeling again like shaylin already said this like sex i mean that screams sex um in the evening there mm -hmm. is feeling in feeling anything is resting in feeling anything is mounting in feeling there is resignation in feeling there is recognition in feeling there is recurrence and entirely mistaken there is pinching all the standards have steamers and all the curtains have bed linen and all the yellow has discrimination and all the circle has circling this makes sand <laughs> yeah this makes sand fantastic you go girl you yeah. know fuck <laughs> The, yeah Good for you <laughs> and, and and there is like there's some reference to to like slicing like sliced roast beef for sandwiches or something uh very mm -hmm. well certainly the length is thinner and the rest the round rest has a longer summer right. to shine why not shine to shine to station to enlarge to hurry the measure all this means nothing if there is singing if there is singing then there is the resumption and it is kind of almost random in terms of it going off that. Yeah. Like, I feel like it, it there's a lot of like peaks and valleys, but it, it does try to like go back to it, but some of it you kind of like lose, but it's still just super sexual. But then it, it goes into like the chickens and the feathers and the right purple room to curve single plates and larger sets and second silver room to send everything away room to have heat and distemper, room to search a light that is simpler. All room has no shadow. Like, oh, that was, it, I, I don't know. Just like the, the repetition again that she, she uses. Yeah. It's in, in the breaths again. Like, I just really like that little section right after the kindness is not earnest. And that was, that was what I was thinking of with the earnesty thing. Kindness is not earnest. It is not assiduous. It is not revered. I thought that was, interesting and kind of played into the whole i guess bigger picture of this in a way yeah there the difference is that a plain resource is not entangled with thickness and it does not mean that thickness shows such cutting it does not it does mean that a meadow is useful and a cow is absurd because cows are kind of an insane animal yeah and when you oh, think yeah. of beef kind of like the purpose of a cow literally i mean how the fuck did that develop like <laughs> it's mostly veg it's vegetarian it just it grazes on grass and shit and then 
he just produces milk and that's it like <clears throat> beef i guess is like the big product that we get from cows beef and milk but sure and it's so they're so huge like yeah they're so big and just kind of lumbering and they don't even really do much they're incredibly kind of docile for large animals too like right I guess the the female cows, at least the bulls, are not. But sure, <clears throat> my favorite part of the roast beef is uh, please be the beef, please beef. Pleasure is not wailing. <laughs> please beef, please be yeah. carved clear. Please be a case of consideration. And it's just like, oh yeah, that that was my one of my favorite parts of this whole section. Please be the beef. Please beef. Pleasure is not wailing. Yeah. And I think I saw like a um, couple paragraphs up. Um, she talks about coal and copper again, kind of like akin to like the first section, which I thought was kind of in good taste. Um, color is in coal. Coal is outlasting, roasting in a spoonful. A whole spoon that is full is not spilling. Coal, any coal is copper. Because I love the copper poem. Like, I don't know why. I just, I love that one. So, I don't know. I just kind of liked how that was very slickly referenced in there out of nowhere. <laughs> but I liked it. Yeah. And it kind of, like, color is in coal. Coal is outlasting, roasting in a spoonful. A whole spoon that is full is not spilling. Coal, any coal is copper. It is kind of... The color associated and then coal, the way it, when you're burning it too, and I guess like coal ovens, like there's the stove and tin reference right before, and mm -hmm. then the kind of coal and the copper, copper pots, right? Like, right. And then when coal gets <laughs> hot, it kind of resembles almost a copper color. Right. When it's like burning. And I mean, never more coal color than all together, right? You know, I just, I don't know. I just, that was just so good just to bring that back in a sense. Like kind of like with like musicians where they'll say a line in a song, but you remember it from like an earlier album on like a totally different track. Just like little things like that, I think is just kind of fun. Just like, like that's where I think it is kind of like blurring that line between earnest and playfulness. Cause then yeah, flu lines down, mm -hmm. please be the beef. Please be, right. please be carved clear. Please be a case of consideration. Like claiming nothing, not claiming anything, not a claim in every in everything. Collecting, claiming all this makes a harmony. If it even makes a succession. And some of it, I'm just kind of reading right now, like in the moment. I, I especially like given the time period, and you know, there's some obscurity to like her personal life, but I feel like. There's also maybe some themes of like accepting things for what they are too, you know? Yeah. And kind of, there's like a meshing of food and emotion and like cloudiness. What is cloudiness? Uh, is it aligning? Is it a roll? Is it melting? Mm -hmm. Like it, it just the kind of the random connection to a dinner roll or something, a roll like this kind of melting butter right this yeah they are just constant references to that kind of stuff but then like my other favorite poem in this uh although mutton like i do like mutton uh is breakfast uh i just the first like little two sentences of that is incredible plus breakfast has always yeah. been one of my favorite meals like just breakfast foods in general <laughs> like breakfast and lunch yeah. are like my favorite like i really like breakfast foods and then sandwiches like i prefer those to like any type of like dinner roast or like steaks or something like i mean i still like all that stuff but like i, just, I feel you though yeah you know, there's something about it yeah no i get that that's great like sandwiches are one of my favorite things like, so I like the lunch kind of aspect of sandwiches and then, like, breakfast. There's just something about the breakfast, like, with pastries or, like, pancakes and, like, eggs and, like, the saltiness of some of the smoked meats that you serve at breakfast usually. 
mm-hmm. sausages and bacon and stuff and ham is kind of I don't know why maybe it's because it's just the first thing in the day but uh, I've always just kind of really liked breakfast and lunch are like my preferred meals uh, I mean I like dinner too but like I just like club sandwiches are I think one of the best inventions in the history of the world no, that's the funny thing too because my my boyfriend like if we're like trying to figure out what to eat on like the weekend or something he's like hey like what are you craving and i'm like i don't know why but i just want a damn sandwich i don't know what it is sometimes that it just hits you know yeah Always, simplicity right it's one of my go-to's if i'm at a restaurant i'll usually get like a club sandwich at like a diner or something and it because it oh, is yeah. just it's It's one of the most indulgent sandwiches, too. Like, speaking of indulgence, like it is. Mm -hmm. You have usually two meats or more on this sandwich. And, yeah, three a lot of times. And you have the bacon. And then you have the three pieces of bread. Like, that's an indulgence. Oh, yeah. It'll still stick to your ribs for sure. (laughs) Well, just like you can only create like, oh, like we had to invent sandwiches and then we invent this club sandwich, which is like this kind of taking that pleasure level of food to the next, you know, the next step Mm -hmm. where it is super indulgent version of sandwich. And it is like, yeah, there's something simple about it, but I think there is an elegance to the sandwich as well. Like I like. Oh, sure. I'm not a fan of fancy sandwiches. Like I really don't like paninis or stuff that's toasted that like I prefer the cold sandwich. I mean, I still like them, but like they're just mm-hmm. if I had a choice, that's like a level like too much for me. I'm very particular about food, so food is like one of those things where I always have these test items like if I go to a restaurant or something, well it's like what are they serving? And if it's like, you know, there are different tiers to that, too. The way it works in my head is like, you know, it's okay, well, how's the club sandwich if it's like a sandwich place? Or like if it's like a pizza place, it's like, okay, well, then pepperoni pizza, like, how is that? Because if that Mm -hmm. isn't good, then nothing else you're serving is going to be good. Like, there's this, like, bullshit. Like, we've reached a level of indulgence with food, I think, too, that's almost, like, disgusting with, like, uh, Mm -hmm. these, like cheeseburger pizzas or whatever like these pizzas trying to be something that they aren't like it's kind of i can't stand that shit and i'm like this is gross it's sloppy like you can't even pick it up and like enjoy a slice yeah like it's just like you it's it's so weighed down with indulgence that you can't even eat it like a piece of pizza you have to uh, I got to be in the mood for something like that. And like, honestly, when I go places, like the, the first two things I ask is like, Hey, like what's your signature thing? Cause I might pick that. If not, like I'm also the type of person, like I want to just like try the craziest thing on the menu. Cause like, you know, I don't know. It's food. Like I, I enjoy like fusion and I don't know, just seeing how food can like push boundaries sometimes, but sometimes even just, a classic Italian, like cold cut, like I'm here. You that's know? one of my favorites. Yeah, that's another one of my <laughs> yeah, favorites. Yeah, dude. That's like my Jimmy John's go to, you know? <laughs> but yeah. My wife always drags me to uh, to some of these new places when they have like a gimmick thing. I guess a lot of that's because of Instagram. They have these like garbage, like food things that I'd like just for the pictures. And then sure. they're like, she always wants to drive me to some place that's like a new thing. And I'm always just like, you know, I can already tell you what this is going to be. Like, I already know this is going to be overrated. Like, the picture looks better than anything tastes. And, uh, yeah, I'm usually right about it because it's always just kind of these gimmicks. And I can't stand the gimmicks. I don't like it when things go too far with that. I'm always like, no, like... I like, yeah, pepperoni pizza, or like if I get like the donuts recently, like there's, I mean, I live in Vegas, so there's a lot of like food gimmicks. Oh yeah, sure. And I can't stand the donut shops that are just like putting all this garbage on top of donuts. Like I don't like it. I'm like, this is too much. It destroys the donut. 
it's like oh, just a regular donut it. usually makes me sick yeah I, I can't do like really like it's funny like i'll crave donuts and then eat one and be like oh why did i just do that and it would even just be like even a simpler like glazed donut it's just like i'm not big on like that category of sweets at all really so yeah i do get that donuts That's a bit much. glazed are one of my favorites like glazed donuts are one yeah. of my favorite foods yeah like i could easily eat like a dozen or more Krispy Kreme glazed like in a single <laughs> sitting it's uh that's and that's one of the perfect foods yeah a glazed donut can you do that right because a lot of places that do all those gimmicks like if they can't do a glazed donut right well then you can't do any of those gimmicks right so I'm not interested like because that's so yeah that's simple. a good point too I'm and kind of it, like that with the uh, like Mexican restaurants where it's like Okay, how good is their salsa that you get on the table? Because that's gonna like predict the rest of the menu. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Mexican's one of my favorite cuisines as well. Or really, I should say Tex-Mex. I like the sure. uh, Tex-Mex the best, where it's the um, slop. Anybody ever in San Antonio go to Rosario's? It's one of the best fucking restaurants for Tex-Mex you'll ever eat. And uh, but it's like. Uh, that and Mexican is like hard to mess up too because it's usually just like a bunch of slop. Sure. Like it's just like a slop on the plate and they just cover it in the sauce. Especially if you go like the really authentic places, it's just like a bunch of slop in a tortilla and they just put like sauce over top of it and it's great. Like that's one of my favorites, but like when it's bad, it's like, oof, all right, like what did you do here? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's hard to mess up. I think it's more of, like, for, for me, from, like, at least from my understanding, like, a lot of it, they actually, like, marinate beforehand, and then they throw on, like, whatever additional sauce, so you can still, like, taste the flavor in the chicken. But my thing is, like, as long as you don't dry out the chicken, I usually have a good time with those Mexican joints. Yeah. Classic <laughs> staple. Classic staple. Yeah, yeah, that's always good. Especially, like, the Tex-Mex plates that, like... <coughs> let you do like the combination plates so you get like a little bit of everything on there too oh yeah sure that's definitely like one of my favorites and i know if if stein were alive right now she would be loving those places <laughs> too but i guess i don't know if they actually Fuck yeah there might have been one or two places that existed that was serving that kind of cuisine but maybe not in sure. paris right but like breakfast, her her poem, like the, the the first few lines of this, I just thought were incredible. Like a change, a final change includes potatoes. This is no authority for the abuse of cheese. What language can <laughs> instruct any fellow? And I just am like, this is incredible. A sudden slice changes the whole plate. It does so suddenly. An imitation, more imitation. Imitations succeed imitations. Yeah, they do. Uh, anything that is decent, anything that is present, a calm and a cook, and more singularly, still a shelter. All these show the need of clamor. What is the custom? The custom is in the center. Oof. I just... Incredible. Incredible. And again, mainly because I'm biased towards breakfast, but I think just like the idea of this, <laughs> there is no authority for the abuse of cheese. Uh, it's these judgments it's the judgment in what's on her plate. It's the judgment in taste. And maybe this is why I'm so drawn to Stein and her kind of work, even if it is kind of abstract and out there, is mm -hmm. that I think it is always getting across these little pieces of judgment. And I don't know, I guess I'm just one of those people that's constantly like thinking about everything all of those things at all times like how does this feel how does this taste what does it look like like how does it is it aesthetically pleasing and why is it aesthetically pleasing why do i like it why don't i like i'm just this type of person and i guess stein was too which is why she was this huge instrumental figure and mm -hmm. i think even something simple like this 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 prose poem about breakfast just shows why she's she's she was so important to to this movement. I mean, the fact that she was first reader on almost all of the, the big modernist writers' books, I think says a lot. Uh, 
and the fact that she was trusted by all of them like like you have to earn that that isn't just something that somebody does but you have to kind of right. earn that trust from somebody to give them your art piece and be like you know what do you think about this right and i don't suspect it was like nepotism either because i mean they could have got to like any i think they considered her place like a salon or whatever or club or whatever you want to call it. like they could have really went anywhere right so like why her but i mean she was a pretty intelligent person in general just from like what i read about like her education and stuff like that so makes sense and and i still like with all this it still draws me back to the narrative because like to your point with the judgment it's like sure there isn't like a narrative there isn't necessarily like a conflict or goal but then you get these little like sound bites of like narrative but then it's so distant because it's third person but it technically is her bias her opinion her observation so there's a lot going on there it's just interesting it's it's just so different in that like structure you know yeah you're so close but so far you know it, that's what's so funny about it yeah again with that then it leads you to interpret yeah yeah the blurry and the ideas into it and breakfast is a longer right. poem too mm-hmm yeah, it's a big one. Right, and I just think it's it's so... The images are so original and unsuspecting to suspect a single buttered flower, suspect it certainly, mm -hmm. suspect it and then glide. Does that not alter accounting? A hurt-mended stick, a hurt-mended cup, a hurt-mended article of exceptional relaxation and annoyance, a hurt-mended. Hurt and mended is so necessary that no mistake is intended. And there's this rhyme that like uses it without actually using any lines to rhyme it either. It's all implied in the internal aspect of kind of the prose. Mm -hmm. And then again, yeah, more references to the previous. What is more likely than a roast? Nothing really, and yet it is never disappointed singularly. A steady cake, any steady cake is perfect and not plain. Any steady cake has a mounting reason, and more than that, it has singular crusts. A season of more is a season that is instead. A season of many is not more a season than most. Burden the cracked wet soaking sack heavily. Burden it so that it is an institution <laughs> in fright and in climate and in, the pre and in the best plan that there can be. Love that. Burden it so that it is an institution in fright and in climate. And I liked, um, it's a little, it's a couple of paragraphs down, but even going back to like, I think simplicity too, because it's like a mixed protection, very mixed with the same actual intentional unstrangeness in writing. A single action cause necessarily is not more a sign than a minister. Um, but that was just going back to just sometimes less is more to her, you know, which is, which is great considering how lavish she was living. You know, it was, it was definitely maybe something you wouldn't, like if you knew her on paper, you wouldn't think that maybe she would have that like opinion either. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by wealth as it's depicted in literature and stuff like that. And there is this tendency to hate wealth at this point in time, but also be envious of it. Like people want it, but then they hate sure. it and they just like, oh, well, you, you know, whatever, you're rich. And it's like, well, mm classist right you know it's, it's, it's hard it. yeah like i mean you would definitely want it so like there's this like i think like i i talk about this a little bit on, on an old old episode a first episode with edith wharton um oh, i did listen to that yeah because yeah. i tried to like before i did your interview i was like trying to like listen to everything from the beginning and then i saw john keats and i'm like okay i have to hear this and i was just and then i started bouncing around so i'm like all over the place with like your episodes <laughs> yeah no worries it's but this idea of wealth, like there is this level to it where I can do this and you can't because I have the money to do it. I have the money to indulge in this. I have the money to sit around and do all these things and like have these petty problems and you hate the mm -hmm. fact that you can't do it, you know, like, and right. that, I think that's, it is kind of an envy that drives a lot of the class resentments, I think. And, uh, mm -hmm. And it's, people are just dishonest about it. Whereas, you know, that wasn't really a thing yet in like literary studies that became more of a thing mm -hmm. when kind of Marxist kind of, um, 
theories became sure. uh, commonplace in the academy, and that was like the sole thing people were using, or at least it gave them something to say about works of art other than talking about the works of art. And like, I'm just like, yeah, it's so dishonest to say that that isn't driven from like an envious standpoint, whereas people mm. literally pray for this, wish for it, dream for it, like, uh, and Stein had it and uh, all these other writers, you know, like had it, Wharton had it, like these kind of unimaginable wealth. Like most people can't even imagine that wealth, like that, what it is, like how few problems you actually have because of it. And uh, I mean, it's part of the reason why we're envious of it. But yeah, I like that she doesn't shy away from it either. Uh, right. That she just kind of does it straight up. Because I, I think, I don't know, I mean, I guess I see this in a lot of art, like, especially people that came from any type of uh, wealth or what they say nowadays is like privilege. Uh, there's right. a tendency to shrink from it. There's a tendency to shrink and say, oh, no, I wasn't like, like, there's like a, there's a level of pretending that you're poor or we're poor or... And there's like, right. as if it's like some honor inducing thing or whatever, like, um, as if you like get something from it, I guess all you get out of it is like some type of like clout, but it's, so I just really appreciate the modernists who just didn't fuck with that at all. Cause it wasn't really a thing culturally or in like academia yet. So it is like, uh, it wasn't, didn't exist, you know, like that kind of pretending to be poorer than you are or whatever to, uh get some type mm -hmm. of like clout it's uh yeah i mean i don't even know where i'm going with that but yeah i mean i, I pick up what you're putting down i mean i i have seen scenarios where people do that ironically and it's like you should just acknowledge where you came from i mean there's still i mean everyone has some sort of uh trauma or something psychological that they probably went through in their life that makes their story individually interesting struggle is universal so he, it's part of the human experience so it's like you know just take accountability you know well i think partly because it will be used against you especially if you ever got any type of a claim if let's say you're an artist or whatever it will be used sure. against you as an insult as a dismissal as a thing to uh yeah like insult an artist or somebody working on something uh it will be used to diminish an accomplishment uh and i don't know when that started but it's just all over the place now yeah and i think it, yeah, it does stem from this envious people are envious of that they wanted that they want who wouldn't want that who wouldn't want that chance you know like like to to do something sure. like that or to have that opportunity. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Uh, so yeah, yeah, like I said, I don't know. I'm uh, getting a little drunk, so I'm going off. There you go. But Happy yeah, <laughs> Sugar, uh, the poem Sugar, I'm not crazy about this poem, but it does have my favorite line in this entire collection. Any little green is ordinary. It is one of my favorites, and I've actually used this in some of my own work because I just love it so much. But That's just cool. the section that it's in, wet crossing and a likeness, any likeness. Okay. A likeness has blisters. It has that and teeth. It has the staggering blindly and a little green. Any little green is ordinary. And I'm just like, the, the judgment that's in that. Any little green mm -hmm. is ordinary. And I think it kind of another theme level to this where she hated the ordinary. And I think a lot of great artists hate the ordinary. She wanted yeah. to make something extraordinary. She wanted to do something that wasn't normal, that wasn't seen before, that wasn't uh, just the same run of the mill stuff. Like, and I know a lot of these writers were kind of rejecting the high romantics and stuff at this time because, again, you know, every generation kind of rebels against the previous. Right. But, uh, yeah, I just I think that little line sums up the attitude, sums up the kind of theme of what she's trying to do with this book. Any little green is ordinary. And I guess green is probably the most abundant color in nature, probably. Sure. 
which is what she's getting at as well. But I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do you think of that? Uh... Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think it's good. I mean, that is her honest opinion. Right. And I understand like, I mean, I love a little contrarianism, like, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it's like, and I'm just speaking generally, not even like for this line, just like on the subject itself, it's like, okay, you want to be different, but when does like you, like, when does it turn into just being like edge Lordian? You know what I mean? Or when does it just end up being like too try hardy? And like some times in certain like stuff with this like maybe it's gonna like the non-cohesive parts it's like this is a bit reachy for me but i understand given the time period like why she just went so hard in the pain with it you know like so like it's hard for me to argue it either way because it's like you know good for you at the same time because at least you did something different i mean i don't necessarily write like this i mean i've done like tangents like this and I, maybe it's rude to call them tangents but like I've written like that a little bit like in high school um, but also it's like this is also 2024 so like I have a completely different perspective and influence but I have huge respect for the work in itself you know because even when I like when you said about inspiring I mean even if I don't fully like the structure or how it looks on the page when you read it. I mean, there's a lot of really good words in here, even if the verbs aren't like quite as powerful. I think sometimes people use verbs to overly color certain texts, you know, at least in the modern, like kind of stuff that we're doing today. It so like, like some of the simplicity yeah. I appreciate. Yeah. So like some of it can be a little too over the top with the verbs where it's like, okay, you like you're on thesaurus.com and like went a little too hard. But like with this, the verbs are simple, but then all the like, you know, like the the nouns and everything, like she really put a lot of thought into and like, I'll have to give her that. So it is, it's different. It's true. Like when you, when you're going for something like that and um, like we already said, I mean, that means that there's going to be a lot of failure. Yeah. That there's going to be a lot of things yeah. that don't work. Absolutely. Uh, and the kind of, uh, it's, I, I mean, almost disgust at, yeah, any little green is ordinary. There is a little level of kind of like maybe upper class disgust or something or like high taste, maybe not even upper class is the right term, but kind of her highbrow taste, you know, can be a turn sure. off. Um, Cause there is an air. But I'm also a bit of a naturalist. So like, yeah. that's probably a part of my issue. <laughs> I mean, good. Hey, that's your opinion. That's fine. We don't. I. I mean, I listen. I like. I like a lot of Bukowski's work, and there's like a mountain of things I disagree with him on. So, and that's perfectly fine. Just the way she goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I think there's like an arrogance to it, right? Which is which can be a turn off uh, when people are super snobby. Or if she was definitely a snob, you know, she was definitely kind of. She wasn't hard. shy about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just goes back to be that kindness isn't earnest. And I think like earnesty in her perspective, you definitely, that's why I think a lot of the writing like can be honest in here, but it still gives you, because it's not like her saying it definitively, it's just in third person. It still gives us the chance to form our own opinions. And, but we can still see like certain little, like sparks of her personality in it, which like, I, I think is like a really nice touch, you know? And like, there's, I, I, yeah, that line about being, cause like when you, all right, let's, you know, you're writing something and everybody that writes knows this, Shaylin knows this, people listening know this, like, you know, you give it to a friend or something and they're almost like, you know, being kind about a work, right. Is, is, is not earnest, right? Like being kind doesn't necessarily mean true or, or, or even correct in, in some sense. And now again, we're talking about in terms of art here, you know, art judgment, we're not talking about, you know, anything else listeners, right. but it's like, so when they're like, Oh, it's good, you know, like, and they're not being earnest in like what they actually think of it, you know, it leads to worse art or it leads to less growth or it leads to, Again, I, maybe it's that thing of judgment that I keep coming back to. I kind of like that, that I like right. that yeah. kind of personality. Yeah. Like I do like, I respect it, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Boldness. I like the people that 
are willing to say things that are as long as they mean them genuinely like you know like i'm obviously not into people that are just doing this for shock or doing it just to get you know like you you use the term edgelord yeah which is the more modern term for it in the social media age this kind of people getting memed into contrarianism for just because their takes out you know you can sell takes online and and you get memed into the kind of contrarianism where it's like oh well if you have an opposite take you get more play you know or some type of unusual take you get more play in like the marketplace online uh, but right. you know that didn't exist during this so just like the level of yeah making it like like so yeah i mean kindness is not earnest like it's kind of there is a performative kindness in a lot of that when you're talking to people about art or and i think there's a fear as well right like there's a fear mm -hmm. that if you veer too far off the kind of accepted or i mean you know i'm not saying anything's wrong with that but it's just like if you fear veer too far off the kind of accepted this is what a good piece is or this is what a bad piece is like um that you know you're out on your own you're uh you're not getting that kind of warm embrace and it's mm -hmm. and she clearly was not afraid of that at all because one she didn't need it you know she had everything she needed but yeah right. so she could have this kind of disgust at this kind of any little green is ordinary which also connects the whole a uh, mixed protection and in, in the last poem before sugar very mixed i think mutton uh, very, very mixed with the same actual intentional unstrangeness in writing, you know, da da da. Um, so it's like she's aware of her privilege, you know, and she understands the pros and cons that come with that, especially when she's going to be putting this out to people, right? So kudos to her. Uh, what else did you like in this? And this, I, I did, um, I really like the chicken section where she goes into like the kind of, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there's like four chicken poems right in a row. My favorite is the second one, but even that, of course, yeah. <laughs> what 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 do you think of that in general? She does this a few times. She does it with potatoes and and all that. Where chicken, 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 chicken. Like, well, I don't know. What what do you think of that? What do you what do you think she was trying to do, or what do you get out of it? You know, just the fact that she had four of them. Um, I'd have to really like is there a transitional reason um, hmm. see I didn't look at them like cohesively and I probably should have because like the other thing I noticed too was that like she mentioned like box more than once and things so I'm like is she just seeing multiple chickens and just spouting stuff but um, so first pheasant and chicken chicken is a peculiar bird alas a dirty word alas a dirty third alas a Dirty third, alas, a dirty bird, which I think is fun. Like, whatever. Alas, a doubt. What is it? Mean potatoes, lo potato loaves. I mean, I don't know. I can't, I don't really know how to pin them together. Um, I don't know. What's your opinion? My initial thought was that they were almost like, yeah, like kind of revisions of the previous one or that they're meant to be in some type of communication. I mean, she almost does this with kind of the certain words, like um, a particular is a particular third. And then the next one, a uh, dirty third. And then the next one, alas, where she kind of switches to alas to connect them. And then kind of um, the last one almost sticking, but I mean, really doesn't have anything else to do with it besides chicken. It, it's like, right. I mean, she does it with potatoes too. And I didn't, I didn't look at those as closely on, on the previous pages where she potatoes, potatoes, roast potatoes. Right. And those are even less, I think, poetic where, yeah, real potatoes cut in between in the preparation of cheese in the preparation of crackers in the preparation of butter in it, potato, roast potatoes for, Right. I don't know, like it's supposed so to like back to this repetition again. Yeah, and I don't know if they're they're supposed to be like in 
some type of communication with one another. I mean, it would make sense if they were because one, they're called almost the exact same thing. Potatoes, potatoes, roast potatoes, and then chicken, 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 chicken. And it's, right. it's, and I mean, I guess it's almost There's like chain linking, but yeah, yeah. almost to, uh, get us to this, this, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I originally thought that these were almost, yeah, in, in revision or in conversation with one another, but right, uh, it would only, because I mean, they're not meant, I think, to make any particular, like, deep, meaningful sense, but I think they're meant to um, redefine or, or I don't know, that oh, last shoot. one especially, stick, stick, call then, stick, stick, sticking, sticking with a chicken, sticking in an extra succession, sticking in. Right, because it's like the third she mentions potato again, and then like two and four. I mean, they're both like I suppose phallic in nature, but it's like when you look at all four of them together, the only other thing I can think is just like one is like a domino effect of the other, and it's just like stream of consciousness to me. And like chicken's just a great sound, like chicken, 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 stick, stick, it's just fun. Yeah, stick, stick, right. all then stick, stick, sticking, stick, sticking, with a chicken. Yeah, uh, like I enjoyed all four. Like they're fun, you know. Whatever. And um, just to warn you, my uh, my AirPods are on like nine percent, so I might have to do something about this. One second. Yeah, no worries. Oh, well, there goes the case. I'm on the old fashioned uh, wired headphones. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it just automatically. Okay, I think I just have to go in my settings and because I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. No, I can now. Just kidding. Yeah. yeah, I think it just took a second. I hope it doesn't like mirror anything when you're recording. No, I mean the only reason I suggest headphones is because usually if we get excited and we start talking uh, with headphones, it doesn't cut us. So it'll record both of us at the you know sometimes without headphones like my speech will cut in through the speakers and like cut you off as we're like getting excited. But like, I just noticed she does the same thing with orange too. orange, orange, oranges, orange in like, um, with these kind of foods, eating, eating, there's two of those. And I, yeah, I mean, I think that they are kind of, yeah. Salad dressing and an artichoke salad dressing and an artichoke, these kind of, Is he just playing on the actual sound itself, I think? I think so. And then I guess to put them on the page right after another is to be adding to them. I, I mean, that's the way I would take it. Like, there, she's, like, trying to add in, add in, add in. Or or even redefine, redefine, redefine as they go through before right. they move on to the next one. Orange is always an interesting one, too, because... Um, uh, why is a fuel oyster an eggster? Why is it orange center? Uh, a show at tick and loose and loose and it's so to speak sat. It was an extra leaker with a sea spoon. It was an extra liquor with a sea spoon. Orange, a type, oh, oh, new, new, not, no, not, no, not, kneeler, kneeler of old show beefsteak, neither, neither. Orange's build is all right. <laughs> So that makes me think that there's a huge juxtaposition, right? Because all of that, that sound right. and the one right before it, and then build is all right. Then orange in, go lack, go lack used to her, cocoa and clear soup and oranges and oatmeal, whist bottom, whist closed, whist, whist clothes, woodling, cocoa and clear soup and oranges and oatmeal. Pain soup, suppose it is question, suppose it is butter, real is, real is, only, only excrete, only excrete, a no sense. A no, a no sense, a no sense when, a no sense when sense, 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 a no sense, a no, a no sense, a no sense, a no sense, a no sense. And I think that where she's almost trying to evoke a different word with those, like a nonsense instead of nonsense and no sense, and then like a not sense, like kind of. Right. And I think that's that's always a lot of fun and the kind of interesting way to do it. Like, because there's the attention to sound. It isn't so much now, right? Like a lot of kind of contemporary poems, there's no attention to sound at all. But with something like this, where she's really playful with it, and and at times not even so, 
and then kind of mm-hmm. juxtaposing juxtaposing it with with a type oh oh new new not no not kneeler kneeler of old show beefsteak neither neither build is all right like it just <laughs> kind of go lack go lack used to her and i think it plays on the kind of go back go back right go lack go lack i mean yeah she i mean this is not that it's like genius level or anything but i think it is kind of using the form to really experiment with what can be done what can be and i think like we already said like it fails so it bumps up against the limits like i'm always fascinated mm-hmm. about the, the limits of language like there's only so many words there's only so many sounds and then there were people like Shakespeare, Berryman, and stuff that would invent words, like because there were no, wasn't a word that they needed, and sure. or combine a few together or whatever, create a new one. And it just kind of, I like that that experimentation. I like the way that this is like something I've never seen before or since. And maybe because it it kind of fails in a lot of ways, so not too many people tried to emulate it, but. And if you want to, like, maybe argue it, too, like, uh, I don't know. It's just fun, right? Going to, like, the last orange, I guess the fourth one. I mean, that whole the no sense of it all. Like, it's just fun. And, like, oranges, when you think of oranges, you think of citrus. You know, I don't know. There's, like, a joy aspect there. And it's just laughter, fun, sun. That's kind of where I'm at when I, like, just hear it. It's just fun. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be, like, super deep. I think that's my problem when I write too, because it's like sometimes I just want to tell a funny story, and like it's okay to just tell a funny story. It doesn't have to like be about like some really intense shit. You know, it can be fun too. Yeah, there's. I think that's a misconception. A lot of stuff where where yeah. you know bleeding on the page is like the term, right? Like mm-hmm. you have to like, and I think that comes from the confessional side of things too whereas oh you have to be bleeding your heart on the page not necessarily you know like you could be doing something like this or or making characters you know Berryman you could be writing about salad Salad. because I mean there's more than one human emotion not everything has to be like super profound like I certainly don't write constantly profound things but it's still enjoyable salad it is a winning cake (laughs) <laughs> a winning cake and like eating that first one eat ting eating a grand old man said roof and never never resoluble burst not a near ring not a bewildered neck not really any such bay like eating like i think that's fantastic <laughs> is it so a noise to be is it at least a, is it a least remain to rest is it a so old say to be is it a leading our bin? Is it so? Is it so? Is it so? And that good, yeah. And I think it just goes back to like, you know, food and sustenance. Like, I mean, it ha- it you produce your own serotonin when you eat, right? You know, it's enjoyable. So I feel like I think she had a lot of fun in this section with that same like purpose in mind, since that's you know, something she probably was really into, especially with it being Paris and this and that. And just, yeah, eating, he eat, eating, he heat eating, he heat it eating, he heat it heat eating, he heat eating. A little piece of pay of pay owls, owls such as pie, bolsters. And I think there there is this, this in, in using sound to, to mean something else. Mm-hmm. Right. Like eel us, eel us with no, no P, no P cool. Eel us, eel us. It's almost like feel us, right? But then it's like eel. Can you actually eat eel? Uh, uh, no P cool cooler. There's a level of discovery within that, I guess, is is, is George's mass. Yeah. Right. I, I, that's part of what I get out of it, too. Or just, yeah, a salad dressing and an artichoke. It was please, it was please, carriage cup and an ice cream and an ice cream. It was too bended, bended with scissors in all this time. A hole is inside a part. A part does go away. A hole is red leaf. No choice was where there was and a second and a second. 
And the more I'm reading this, the more I'm kind of in, engrossed with it too, with this kind of please pale hot, please cover rose, please acre in the red stranger, please butter all the beef steak with regular feel faces. Like that I is, really like that. Yeah, incredible. And it's called salad dressing and an artichoke. Yeah. I mean, I feel like this, like, maybe it's just me projecting here as a bisexual woman. Go on, but, and, like, go on uh, and project. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know. I think this is a lot. Like, I, I think another thing in here, too, is, like, while kindness is not earnest, I, I still think there's a lot of, while she's being observational, I feel like there's a lot of things about, like, acceptance. And I think it's... I think a lot of this deals with her wanting acceptance and her maybe even trying to get that with like her own like sexuality. I don't know enough about her and maybe I'm just psychoanalyzing her, but with someone who's still into psychology and, and I don't want to get into rooms just yet, but I feel like when you look at it overall, while these are her observations and her perceptions of things, I think this also shows just like, the human experience at the most mundane, the, you know, all the different highs and lows of a human experience. Cause we have like some, you know, funny whatever stuff, but then we have like all these pleas in here too, you know, like an actual plea in a sense. So it's interesting because like you can just go from a high and drop all the way down to a low in a matter of minutes. Right. So I feel like I got like the same thing in the cadence of like the tones just on that one page, you know, going from oranges to that. Please pale hot. Please cover rose. And just how the second one ends too, because no choice was where there was and a second and a second. No choice was where there was. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I was like that to me, at least like when I read it, I'm like, that's kind of heavy, man. But going from no sense to that, you know. It's one of those collections where, like, the more you read it, the more it starts to make sense to you. And I talk mm -hmm. about this before where, like, uh, part of the beauty of poetry is that kind of making sense of something while before it actually makes sense in the written language. So, like, it's conveying right. meaning without it making any sense in, like, kind of a syntactical way, like kind of the language way you're still and that's getting, what she wanted with art yeah, yeah you're getting the vibe of it you're mm -hmm. getting the overall thing from it like that what's being intended because i mean i guess that's one of the main things with writing at least from my perspective especially like with my experience like with this, with songwriting too is like you want to evoke some sort of emotion right that's what connects us humans maybe not like our intraday experiences but the way we react to those experiences and those like inner feelings and we can all interpret those things like through these lines you know at whatever rate just like when you're looking at a painting absolutely getting something without without understanding it yeah like like understanding without it making sense is yeah I must think, yeah, you know, that talking heads stop making sense. Fuck yeah, I love the talking heads, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's how I knew, like, my parents were smoking weed when I was a kid. If I heard that on, like, a Saturday, I'm like, all right, shit's about to go down. <laughs> uh. Yeah, all right, well, then let's go to the final rooms. And this is, like, one big long one, listeners, is, like, the final section of this. And the ending, the final sentence is just incredible, too. But um, I kind of, you know, we said this all along, but I just, it was so inspiring, so playful the way she was going with this. Uh, I don't know. What, what did you think of Rooms when you read it? Like, initial impressions, I think, whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on here. And, like, I feel like as she's going through all these different areas like the easiest way I can sum it up in like a sentence or two is like it feels like it's different parts of like the human like brain or like psyche in a sense like I just think it's super psychology heavy not you... like emotions but like I guess like uh it's hard to explain like different parts of like the brain kind of in a sense and like the way that you 
cogn like that was the word like the way that you kind of just like work things out like cognitively you know yeah i was gonna ask you what do you mean by that like kind of moving from room to room but in the kind of metaphorical sense of yeah moods right. maybe moods emotions yeah and just like situations yeah because it's not like like i mean obviously there is like varying emotion in it but i think just like the way that someone looks at something like like the way that someone like makes something out like i can't explain it i don't know but let's just go into it i'll sound like an idiot but <laughs> no i mean i think you're right i think it's it's I feel the same way where it's this kind of, I think she's getting at something where, you know, we live mostly in rooms. Mm -hmm. There is this room to room, depending on what room you're, you know, a doctor's office waiting room feels different than like your living room that you're familiar with or like a guest living room. Or if you go into somebody's house and the room is all white, there's like a tendency. I say like museums right. have this feeling when you go into a museum, there's like this, like, Oh, you better not touch anything. The room gives you that's all white. It's shiny. There's bright, bright lights. Um, right. It I think it's of, like intention. Yeah. There's that like makes sense. Yeah. A communication between the room you're in and like the feeling you get and like how you're supposed to behave or feel like you're supposed to behave at least. Right. And I guess like, more socio, like sociologically in a sense. Yeah. 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 And I think there's also like a level of exploration. Oh yeah. Where like when you're in a strange house or a strange room, there's like an urge to open the doors or the medicine cabinets. Like, are you one of those people that opens the medicine cabinets in people's houses or, uh, I'm nosy. Yeah. Like when you go into yeah. a bathroom <laughs> And you just see that kind of stuff. It's, uh, yeah, I think that's definitely in there. And like, yeah, if the center has the place, then there is distribution. That is natural. There is a contradiction in naturally returning. There comes to be both sides and the center. That can be seen from the description. Almost like describing an art piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then kind of, like you said, kind of moving through rooms in the mind, the author of all that is in there behind the door, and that is entering in the morning. Explaining darkening and expecting relating is all of a piece. The stove is bigger. It was of a shape that made no audience bigger if the opening is assumed. Why should there not be a kneeling? Any force which is bestowed on a floor shows rubbing. This is so nice and sweet, and yet there comes the change. There comes the time to press more air. This this does not mean the same as disappearance. And I think that gets to what you were saying, too. Because then it, this does not mean the same as disappearance. And then, like, it gets into, like, little lingering lion in a Chinese chair. Like, it's almost like, it makes me think of, like, the, um, I think it's the pineal gland. Sorry for all the experts out there. I don't remember as well as I used to. And that kind of harnesses, like more of like the dreams and stuff like that so like when i was going through it that was like kind of what i was seeing but it could have just been bias after the fact that i like read about her but um that's kind of like what it made me think of just like the way like certain things were or how like uh any force which is bestowed on a floor shows rubbing like it makes me think of just like uh like your frontal lobe because like your frontal lobe is just like your coordination and just like your gut right like inhibitions like your natural like reflexes right so it made me think of that with like this force yeah all the handsome cheese which is stone all of it and a choice a choice of a blotter and i think that gets to her her thing too right like every little detail matter matters every little decoration and trinket in the room is a source of judgment um mm -hmm. uh, uh an expression of the self in some way uh, right. If it is difficult to do it one way, there is no place of similar trouble. There is so many different ways. Yeah, none. The it's a codex, man. It's a yeah. Rubik's cube. <laughs> yeah, the whole arrangement is established. The end of which is that there is a suggestion, a suggestion that there can be a different, a different whiteness to a wall. This was thought. I think that gets to what you're saying too. Like this kind of, 
looking at the the tone of whiteness on a wall right like there's all those different shades of color where they have like the eggshell or there's like the soft or like the off white or uh i mean any color and then you think of it in the thought yeah this might be one of her more um uh down to earth kind of or i guess i don't mean that i mean like like easier to understand Mm -hmm. uh poems in this like you're getting a tour you know yeah my some of my favorite lines yeah all along the tendency to deplore the absence of more has not been authorized i like uh the time when there is not the question is only seen when there is a shower any little thing is water kind of like the the green ordinary i have that one i thought that was kind of cute yeah Uh, i like that any little thing is water, which could mean flowing, which could mean evaporation. Right. I mean, the cycle, right? I mean, same thing with time. You know, there's a beginning and there is an end, and that's the one thing we can't defeat, right? You know? And just the fluidity flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, the time when there is not the question is only seen when there is a shower. Yeah. Yeah, just and you do like there was a whole collection made, a damp cloth, an oyster, a single mirror, a mannequin, a student, a silent star, a single spark, a little movement and the bed is made. Love that. This shows the disorder. Yeah. It does. It shows more likeness than anything else. It shows the single mind that directs an apple. All the coats have a different shape. That does not mean that they differ in color. It means a union between use and exercise and a horse. And there is like you would you've been hinting at this. There is like a philosophical underpinning to this collection too. Like, oh yeah. And I feel like she just calls out like, while well, like to your point, like classism wasn't necessarily a thing, but I think she saw. I mean, I know like generally she was liberal, but like, uh, you definitely see that she, there's like a, a source of like equality, like as far as like no matter where you come from, you know, there was a union between use and exercise and a horse. Whether the horse be like, you know, your worker, whatever. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, or like, yeah, the use, like literally the use of an object or the use of a room and then exercise, right? Which is usually meant as like, not so much use, but practice and then and a horse, which she right. throws in there to really yeah. tie it. Whereas horses, I guess you could say or have some type of use, but they're quite different. Right. And this one has that that banger of a last last sentence here. Yeah. Where the care with which there is incredible justice and likeness, all this makes a magnificent asparagus and also a fountain. Magnificent. Back to the water. Yeah, magnificent asparagus. That's a good band name. Right there. You know, if anyone out there needs a band name, it's just to flip through this book and just pick some words because there's some pretty dope shit in here. Especially if it's a punk band. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's really good. And I, I, like, I feel like a lot of themes of like the like cycles and like life, I think, is really in here too. Just like regeneration. I mean, maybe there is more to the Malachite than I thought, you know, transformation, new beginnings. Yeah. Especially when I think of fountains. That, and this, there's this reference to decisions too, that this kind of decisions, judgment, taste, that whole last thing I didn't even realize is that the the one long sentence and then that last short sentence, what what was the Mm -hmm. sensible decision period? The sensible decision was that notwithstanding many declarations and more music, not even notwithstanding the choice and a torch and a collection, notwithstanding the celebrating hat and a vacation and even more noise than cutting, notwithstanding Europe and Asia and being overbearing, not even notwithstanding an elephant and a strict occasion, not even withstanding more cultivation and some seasoning, not even with drowning and with the ocean being encircling, not even with more likeness in any cloud, not even with terrific sacrifice of pedestrianism and a special resolution, not even more likely to be pleasing, 
the care with which the rain is wrong and the green is wrong and the white is wrong, the care with which there is a chair and plenty of breathing, the care with which there is incredible justice and likeness. All this makes a magnificent asparagus and also a fountain. And I'm just realizing reading that now and being a little drunk, she's talking about creation. (laughs) Yeah, it's cyclical. Where she's talking about making this decision. This makes something as simple as a magnificent asparagus or a fountain or a painting or, or, or Asia and Europe being overbearing or, you know, a city. These are all decisions um, that, that, that lead to the act of creation, whereas like the act of creation is making decisions like this. And then the care, the care of this, the actual care, like I think more literally, like the care, literally to care or taking, you know, one's time with it, like the artisan, the craft of it, with which there is incredible justice and likeness. It's, yeah, the care with which the rain is wrong and the green is wrong. Again, that kind of any little green is ordinary and the white is wrong. And this is, you know, referring to rooms and stuff, but even broader than that. Mm-hmm. the care with which there is a chair and plenty of breathing like the care with which a chair is placed in a room and the space that it provides i think in terms of breathing the kind of the way the room oh, yeah. breathes the way the decorations make you feel like you said it when we first started talking about this last section domestication yeah, yeah or just like the 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 the, the, the psychological like emotional like evoke like evoking these feelings when you're going into a room what makes a room better than another room right what makes a decoration Mm -hmm. better than another decoration what makes it wrong or right or correct or something you know and i think even more so in art making right like what makes something good or bad what makes it work what makes it does what makes it not work like i mean the care with which there is a chair i mean she's pretty much asking you to sit right you know and that's what it's all about. Or I mean, like, and then you go back to the very first poem, the last sentence, the difference is spreading. Hence the cycle, hence the fountain and the flow. So, yeah. Yeah. And I said, like, rereading this, this is one of those books, listeners, where you you do have to reread it a few times. And I think the more you go back to it, the more it starts to reveal itself to you, which it helped me a lot. Yeah. yeah, like which which even us just talking about it now, like we're both getting new ideas and new new interpretations. Like it's it's I mean, this is what makes art great. This is what makes it so fun and interesting and and life giving, really. And she talks about that, too, I think, like in terms of breathing, uh, the kind of expansion, <laughs> this kind of energetic life-giving force that is kind of creation or making art and and out of something so small like it's called tender buttons right like like the little object on a coat or a shirt or something a tender button like you can romanticize that little thing into i was even just thinking of like the mother you know like a nipple not to be too frank you know like once again life right you know nurturing that too yeah the teats the life-giving yeah. breasts the milk uh yeah yeah but yeah the, the care with which there is a chair where it's placed how how you can sit in it does it face a window can you sit in that chair and then be completely changed perspective right. in the room yeah, so I definitely get how this was her, you know, painting, right? Yeah. I mean, this whole thing definitely, like, when you really get to the end, if you didn't already kind of catch up in between, you know, like, even for myself, just going along the ride, like, I get it. Like, yeah, I just, it's really, you know, like, it's funny, because, like, when I look, dude, like, straight up, kind of like I said before, I had apprehension. Like, when I was reading it, I'm like, this is stupid, but, like, you know, you just put it down if you get overwhelmed, pull it back up, read it aloud, and like, you know, it'll it'll come to you. And that's that's I think the whole point of it for her too is that like with someone who was so like in the psychology and everything as well and like studied it so like deeply, you know, you're gonna 
you're going to expect everyone to have a different interpretation just like when you look at any surrealist painting so like this is all a part of her big plan you know <laughs> so i like it i like it a lot and it's you know berryman i always keep making the comparison to berryman because i do see a lot of parallel between it but it's just like uh -huh. i when i read stuff about that when it won the pulitzer when it came out the original 77 and people were criticizing it for like oh it doesn't make sense right like they were like oh and there uh -huh. are things that don't make quite makes sense it's it's kind of like tender buttons in this kind of abstract sense and it goes back and forth between making perfect sense and then being kind of abstract they would be like oh it doesn't right. i don't understand that i don't understand it. i remember his wife would always was asked about it and then his wife at the time said oh read it again like if you don't understand it you know that's what that was her response in like interviews and right. stuff oh you should read it again like and then as you do it does start to open up even now and yeah then talk about it with someone again join heavy board book club and come talk with us with us about it like get drunk and talk books it's it's hell yeah i mean i think it, it does it makes you appreciate that too like it did like a lot like going through it with you like helped me like just like especially just like really like just breaking it down i'm just like damn okay you know i'm glad i just followed through with it because like i try to be open-minded but man at first i was like maybe i'm not smart enough for this even though i'm little miss 4.0 i have no fucking idea but you know it's really just anybody can read this if they just are a little patient you know yeah and i don't think it has anything to do with intelligence it's it's it's, it's no it's it doesn't it's the feeling yeah it's it's spending enough time mm -hmm. with it until it starts to unwind itself a little bit like you know I think I mean I think that's why people are intimidated by poetry. It's like, oh, if I don't get it right away, then I'm an idiot. It's like, no, that's not the case at all. Like this is a high art form that takes many type of going back. You know, it's like when you see like a weird movie and you're like, what the fuck? You have to go back and rewatch it, and then all these little things, right. details like, and you start to make associations. I mean, maybe it was just because we were getting drunker throughout that we started to like it more. I'm sure she was a big drinker. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I bet she was. That's how I'm telling the story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. No, definitely. I'm like, damn. Okay, because like a, a big part of me too is like, uh, I'm like, oh, there's no cohesiveness, you know? Because like in school, like it's just like narrative, 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 and I get that's like pounding in my head. But now I'm just like, well, I mean, there there is narrative sound bites in here. You just gotta like look for them, and a part of it is you making your own narrative, and I think that's wonderful honestly plenty of room for breathing literally yeah, yeah. that's what it, she's like yeah they let this breathe a little bit and go wide wide and hard mm -hmm. with that yeah incredible right. incredible for real yeah that was great this was a lot of fun that so, was sick yeah no thank you this was freaking awesome yeah I, I feel like I just learned so much. And like when you said about like inspiring, like um, it does inspire me to write and play around more, you know, not everything has to have a beginning, middle and end, you know, and the way the I sound, yeah. Like I wanted to kind of just start messing with sound. Yeah. And, right. And repetition. Yeah. I would, and, you know, that's the thing too. I get scared of repetition sometimes and, but I'm like, well, this is where it's done well. So I mean, yeah, I you have to just fuck around and, and maybe fail a lot to get there, too. Yeah, before it starts to like, oh, oh yeah, like that actually worked. I've right. I, I don't like to talk too much about stuff I haven't published, but it just like I've been working on some weird things that were like these kind of character things that are very abstract. And I, you know, for it took a long time to get anywhere with it, with just kind of repeating 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 and like because you want it to repeat but you don't want it to be nonsense you don't want it to be stupid you know even like you don't want it to be lame mm -hmm. so it's like right it's it's really doesn't uh it, it takes work yeah it's a lot of work but yeah any final thoughts or i think uh, that really anything i've really hit? pretty much summed it up yeah any little any little green is ordinary 
That's my <laughs> final thought. Yeah. And we should be going for the extraordinary. All right, yeah, if you want to come participate in this, feel free, y'all. Uh, heavy board, uh, patreon.com slash heavyboard. Join the Heavyboard Book Club. Uh, you can get to see us in the group chat. Me and Shaylin are in there discussing for the next book that's going to come up on the podcast for the book club here. So this is going to be a reoccurring thing. If you want in, patreon.com slash heavyboard. Check it out. Uh, and you can also get in on the group chat that we have with that, where we kind of discuss these books and, and where to go with them and what to do next. And you can put your input in there, what you'd like to go over uh, with others in the in the group and all that. So, yeah. Shailen, this has been fantastic. Uh, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Hell yeah, man. Thank you so much. Heavy. Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Board. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.